Hello, fellow misfits. Tonight we'll take you on a heart-pounding ride through the macabre and the inexplicable true scary stories that will make your spine tingle. Also, we know it's almost the end of the July, so we hope you're enjoying the summer. Thank you for your support. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. And now... Story time! Earlier this year, me and friend toured Chernobyl in the abandoned city of Pripyat. Part of our three days there was a trip to a children's pioneer camp, it's in the middle of nowhere, one road in, one road out. Anyway, the camp has all these wooden huts covered in the Soviet equivalent of Disneyland characters and is eerily quiet like the rest of the exclusion zone. My friend, myself and our tour guide had been exploring the old huts for about half an hour, finding occasional remnants of summer's past, old beds, desks, lamps, posters etc., just the three of us, miles from anyone else. Or so we thought. As I turned around taking a 360 degree video, I see a guy creeping out from behind one of the huts I've just walked past, about 10 meters behind me. When he saw that I spotted him following me he scurried back. I had no idea who this was, nor did our guide. A little afterwards I saw the same guy walking with who I thought was our guide. He was wearing camouflage fatigues like our guide, but it wasn't actually him. Turned out there were actually two of them, the other one apparently had an axe. We left pretty soon after. How they got in there, remember there is a 30 mile exclusion zone around Chernobyl, and what they were doing, I have no idea. A few years ago, Myself and a bunch of climber buddies were camping out in a well-known climbing area in Tennessee. It's not really that backwoods at all, but you feel very remote. The area is beautiful and the forest is thick. The climbing ain't bad. One night it was an especially cold and calm new moon. There was no wind at all and it had rained recently, so the leaves were wet and didn't crunch underfoot. We had the fire going late into the night, not wanting to go to our freezing tents. Anyone who has sat around a campfire knows that feeling you get when the last flame dies and all you have left is an empty timber pile and the warm glow of the coals. At that exact moment when the last flame went out, we started to hear someone in the parking area tuning up a fiddle. That's not so weird right? We're in rural Tennessee after all. After a few moments of tuning, the player breaks out in full song. It was incredibly beautiful and the sound carried perfectly through the still air. My heart was on fire. I wanted to meet the man playing this wonderful music in the dark. I told my buddies I was going to go find the guy and ask if I could play with him for a song or two. Let me remind you, it was very cold. There's no way I could have played for more than a song, but this person played for a few by the time I got up. My friends never said a word to me. Never warned me not to go, never said it was a good idea, didn't even look at me. They just listened. I knew the area well and made my way to the parking area by instinct, following the music. As my foot transitioned from the leaves to the gravel in the parking area, the music stopped mid-measure. My heart rate spiked. I stood still for only a moment before I turned on my headlight which had been off despite the new moon so I could save what little night vision I had in these conditions. There was no one there. I looked around the parking lot and all I saw were our cars. I ran as fast as I could back to our tents to tell everyone what happened, but they were all asleep. I know it was just some mountain main messing with us, but to this day my friends won't talk about it. I'm not really a believer in ghosts but let me just say that right now however I saw something that I cannot explain one night while working the night shift as a ranger. I was patrolling a very wooded area, a very popular camping spot, this was in central Illinois. I won't tell you the park name. It's always been weird to me because this place is usually packed during the day but at night it's different, not that many campers stay overnight here. So this was right around 1.30 in the morning, and I just started my second round of patrolling, 
and I see this tall dark figure standing near an old cabin on one of the trails. For whatever reason, I thought it was a mannequin somebody had left out here for a prank, just because of the way it looked and how still it was. I got closer and realized I was wrong in my judgment. It was moving very slowly, though, but as soon as I shined my light on it, it didn't have a face, no eyes, no nose, no mouth, nothing. It was just this dark silhouette with what appeared to be arms and legs and looked just like a human only in shape, of course, it was completely black. The figure also appeared to have some sort of cloak or cape draped over him or her. So obviously I'm trying my best not to panic. My mind is racing with possible explanations for this thing. Perhaps some mischievous college students dressed in cloaks playing a prank, perhaps I'm hallucinating. Either way, it's creeping me out, and I want no part of whatever this thing is. But before I can turn around and walk away or run for that matter, this thing picks up speed and begins to run towards me. This thing gets about 20 feet from me and leaps up about 30 feet into the air, up into the trees like some sort of wild animal. And now I am freaking out, and panic is setting in. I'm obviously not dealing with a regular person, this is something else entirely. And like some wild crazy animal, it's jumping around on all fours from tree to tree, following me, keeping parallel with me as I'm running back to my truck. I run as fast as my legs could take me but found myself near the campground's entrance where I made a break for my truck, jumping inside and locking the door behind. I just sat there in silence for about 3 to 5 minutes, trying to catch my breath, thinking to myself I hope that thing leaves. I was too afraid to even shoot at it, and I had no idea how am I ever going to report this. I mean, number 1, who's gonna believe me, and number 2, my up aboves are probably gonna mock me and ridicule me. I could even lose my job if I reported such a thing, or maybe they even speculate that I was on drugs. So I kind of just sat there and sank in my seat, not sure how I should go about telling about this. This was easily one of the creepiest and most paranormal things I've ever experienced on the job. I never saw it again after that, thank God. My background is neuroscience and biology, nothing out of the ordinary for an academic. I've worked for multiple pharmaceutical companies, I was even one of the early employees at Eli Lilly's neuroscience division. At a medical device company, I was in college during the tail end of the Cold War when Reagan was in office, and the evil empire was still around. I had a couple of friends, John and Pat, for the story. They were on top secret clearances as part of some army intelligence programs. John was one of the smartest people I ever knew, with a genius level IQ, easily in the top 1% of people. Pat was in John's same grad school program. They were part of a special operations unit in the US Army, working on top secret biological warfare research, believe it or not. I don't know all the details, but they were most likely involved in creating pathogens. John and Pat were tight-lipped about their project for obvious reasons, but they were pretty open about how easy it was to create biological weapons. They mentioned the possibility of maybe having created some sort of pathogen that was incurable. John had a brother who worked at Fort Detrick. John talked about him crying when he found out what they were working on. His brother told him that nobody would believe them if they ever spilled the beans about what was really going on. Years go by, John and Pat get out of the army and are immediately enlisted in this government project that was busy investigating various chemical and biological agents. They were tasked with creating new kinds of pathogenic weapons. I forget what they called it, but basically, they were trying to create new strains of pathogens that they could then use in experiments on animals. They were tasked with finding the best way to create new pathogens without being detected. They were able to take samples of various kinds of engineered viruses and use them as a vector for a new kind of pathogen, test each one on animals. This would allow them to learn a lot about the best way to create new pathogens without having to use them. John and Pat said this was really easy, even without using live viruses as vectors. They could simply extract the genetic material from the pathogen, 
Find a vector so it could be transferred into another organism, like harmless bacteria, for example, and then test it. The product of this kind of experiment is a pathogen that can be used as a weapon, but it would be a biological weapon that could never be traced back to its source. At some point in their tenure at this project, they received a call from the Pentagon. They were told that one of the samples they'd been testing was extremely dangerous, and it had somehow gotten loose. They were told to pack up their stuff immediately and leave the premise and not say a word about what had happened and what they had worked on. They were discharged, for lack of a better word, from the project altogether and given $200,000 each in settlement under the table. They had no idea how it happened that this pathogen had got out of the lab, but it was later very quickly contained by military personnel before ever reaching civilian territory. Shortly thereafter, John and Pat were immediately moved into the bioweapons division that worked on creating humanoids of various kinds by intersplicing DNA of a variety of species, with the ultimate goal to create a superhuman soldier. I don't remember the details he told me, but they worked on creating a new type of being with superhuman abilities that, if it ever escaped, would be virtually unstoppable. Fortunately, that has not happened. Pat told me that because of his past history, John was considered a security risk, and he was not allowed to be anywhere near the facility where this new type of being was being created. Pat apparently wasn't allowed on site, only on the periphery of where he would be stationed, looking at security feeds. I asked Pat what had happened with this bioweapons division. He told me that it started as a joint CIA and military project, but it fell more and more into the control of the military as its life went on. Pat had suspicion that something had happened, apparently, there was a falling out between the head of the CIA, and the CIA eventually lost total control of the project. I don't really remember the details, but he said it soon became very obvious that the military was now conducting experiments, creating new weapons based on designs and ideas from this project. Pat had a feeling that they were, in some way, responsible for creating a new kind of pathogen and they would use it in some experiments in the field. I don't remember who they were experimenting on, but Pat said it was very obvious that they were no longer in control. There's a lot more to the story, but I asked him if he could give me some specific examples of something that had happened in the field. He told me he'd have to think about it. The next time we talked, he told me that it seemed like all the lawsuits that came out of the US soldiers who were exposed to something in Iraq, that's what it seemed like to him. I even asked him if he could explain that a little bit better since I was having trouble understanding. He told me that at first, there were rumors and concerns about a new type of pathogen, and then that's when lawsuits emerged. He thinks they were being told to put soldiers from Iraq into quarantine, he thinks that's what the lawsuits were about, as if there was some sort of big cover-up. I asked him if he can tell me more about what had happened. Was this some sort of new virus? He explained no, but he was not allowed to tell me any more than that, he's already spoken too much. I don't want to push him, so we moved on with the conversation, going back to the bio life forms that they were working on. He informed me that several of these subjects were still being created and worked on today. They were initially designed to be used during the Iraq war in the early 2000s, but for reasons unbeknownst to him, the plug was somehow pulled, and bioweapons were not used. That was part of the reason 9-11, I guess, was originally conducted, due to pressure from the CIA, military, and other shadow branches of government putting pressure to have means to test these new subjects. Of course, among many other reasons, but that's a rabbit hole he did not dive deep into. Again, he thinks the US government has used these new life forms in some capacity, and it's most likely happening without people even realizing. He said during his time, they were working on humanoids, and the project was still in its infancy when he left. He stated that they were nowhere near mature enough to be used, and the only reason he was still employed at the facility is that they needed people to help run these experiments. This was, of course, the pre-alpha stage, as he calls it. He said that they would bring these deformed humanoids to him, and he was supposed to experiment on them, but there's a lot more going on behind the scenes, 
Of course. This was all before he was banned from the facility, only working the security feed, and long before John was banned. Pat had been told that he was being used to run tests on these humanoids, but there were other things going on where he was also being used to experiment. One of these said experiments was the J-Rod, who became well known for making contact with several other high-ranking military and government officials. Again, he did not go into detail but mentioned there were these groups that put together, made up of various divisions of the military, to make contact. He did not want to go into any further detail with that. I told him I understood, I asked him if there was anything else he wanted to add, and he told me that the whole time he was working there, he was still trying to figure out what the whole facility was about, and that's why it took him so long to leave. It wasn't until he began to see the humanoids that he began to realize it was something more than just military experiments. Pat said that at the time, the facility was beyond top secret, and then even most of his co-workers didn't know exactly what they were doing at first. This was before the experiments really began, they had to go in blind at first while things were being set up. They were forbidden to ask too many questions. He even told me the only reason why he was able to see the humanoids is because of his rank and his tour of duty. Most people were not allowed to see them, and the ones who did had their lives threatened. Pat stated that he is fairly certain that the old facility is now sold, and it's now a part of an advanced military industrial complex. He also mentioned that there are corporations involved with whatever is going on. He said that part of what made it so difficult to leave was because there were people watching him, and he knew that if he left with the sensitive information he had, his life could be threatened. He was also scared that the new military personnel at the facility might try and do harm to him or his family. The reason I told the story to the person I did is that it was something that really stuck out in my mind when he said it. I knew that I had to share it with somebody, and this site seemed like a good place. That was the first I'd ever heard of Pat talking about the facility, and when I think about it, he still knows a lot of information. He was in charge of a good portion of a large military base, after all. Pat has been retired for quite some time now, and he's in his late 60s. I think it's fair to say that he's old enough and retired enough not to necessarily fear for his life. Pat has lived a full life at this point. In conclusion, I hope you take the information here to heart and understand that our government and military do not have your best interest. We are but cattle for them to slaughter and experiment on, our lives mean nothing to the greater good of humanity and country. These kinds of things, not specifically bioweaponry but experimenting, have been going on for a very, very long time. I think we're just now seeing a lot of it coming to the surface, and it's scaring people. Remember to always think for yourself, and know that eventually, the truth will come out. One final quick note, all the information here might seem disorganized and disingenuous, but all the intel I've gathered for you is a combination of information I've gathered from over years and years of conversations with Pat and John alike. So, if there are any details that overlap or don't make sense, just know that and try to put all the pieces together yourself. Besides, I've given you all the information, I hope this is enough. I'll never forget that day in Grand Canyon National Park. The rumors of strange sightings had been circulating among the visitors for weeks, and as the park ranger, I couldn't ignore the whispers any longer. Cryptids? Creatures of legend and myth? I was skeptical, to say the least. But duty called and I had to investigate. One morning, during my routine patrol, a foul odor filled the air. It was putrid and overpowering, drawing me in like a magnet. I followed the stench into the depths of the deep woods, the ancient trees towering above me. The smell grew stronger with every step, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. As I emerged into a small clearing, my heart skipped a beat. There, on all fours, was the creature I had only heard about in wild stories. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Its fur was black and matted, hinting at the struggles of its untamed existence. Its face resembled that of a wolf, but with a broader and shorter muzzle, making it appear oddly menacing. 
Those eyes, oh those eyes. They were yellow, but not the vibrant hue of sunflowers. No, they glowed with a dim, eerie amber red that sent shivers down my spine. Its ears resembled those of a Doberman pincher, with a distinct cropped effect. And those front legs, they were unnaturally long, like those of a bodybuilder. The paws were more like massive hands adorned with razor-sharp claws. The creature stood up on its hind legs, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The sickening popping sound filled the air, echoing as if amplified through loudspeakers. I felt the ground tremble beneath me as its massive, steroid-pumped body rose to an astounding height. There was no tail that I could see, and it towered over me even from a distance of 10 meters. I was no giant myself, standing at 5 foot 4 inches, and this creature was a colossus in comparison. My curiosity overwhelmed my fear, and I found myself inching closer, cautiously observing the cryptid in awe. Suddenly, it let out a howl that resembled more of a ferocious roar, and my heart pounded in my chest. This was it. I dared to take a few more steps, yearning for a closer look. But my presence had not gone unnoticed. The creature's head snapped in my direction, its yellow eyes locking onto mine. With a swift and graceful movement, it turned and sprinted away, its howls echoing in the distance. I was left standing there, trembling and in awe of what I had witnessed. There was no doubt now, all those cryptid sightings reported by visitors were true. The legends were real, and I had come face to face with one of them. In September 2002, I was living in my camper truck at the top of the McNair Creek Valley near Port Mellon, British Columbia. One foggy morning, I climbed up into the old growth and wandered around eating blueberries and listening. I had my sturdy hiking stick but was not even carrying any bear spray. After a few hours I headed back to my camp. I had to walk down a steep scree field at the base of which was my front bumper. Carefully, step by step, I descended the wobbly boulders on my wobbly ankles. I stepped off the last boulder onto a flat old road surface just in front of my truck. When I raised my eyes, I saw that some scraggly bushes, six feet away, were shaking and vibrating. I thought there must be some squirrels fighting in there. That is the only thing that could make bushes vibrate like that. I stepped forward and poked my stick into the branches to separate them. Suddenly, the shaking area grew to a larger area, three feet in diameter. Then this area of violently vibrating bushes moved away from me and accelerated up a steep slope. Out of curiosity, I tried to follow it, looking into the hole it was making in the vegetation. There was nothing in the hole. The running hole in the forest displaced vegetation in the shape of a tall, bipedal, hefty creature. It went up that steep slope as fast as the fastest running man you could ever see. It disappeared from my sight, over the top of the slope. Wow, I thought, an invisible Sasquatch and I had been two feet away from it. I must have poked it in the shin with my stick. It was afraid of me. I write this for other people who have experienced the predator. Glimmer man, that's what we call it. From the many accounts I have read, this thing is something different from a Sasquatch. From reading many accounts, it is an alien with cloaking and anti-gravity technology. It watches people and it likes to run through the forest. I harvested my first three bucks with my bow when I was 13 years old. I harvested them back to back three weekends in a row. I had an excellent teacher, my dad. I grew up in a small town called Morganza in Louisiana. Not far from there is where I learned to hunt on an island called Rikasi Island. I've also been a hunting guide and horseman for years in Colorado. I live in South Central Pennsylvania now after moving 16 years ago to Maryland. On March 5th I'll be 51. I had numerous experiences with these beings. I'll throw out two or three short ones. At least I'll try. When I was 17 years old, I was in a tree stand, bow hunting about 8 feet off the ground to get to this particular stand. This was off the Mississippi River across the canal. 
I could hear something huge running towards me. I could hear it when it jumped over the canal and landed. What scared me the most was how heavy it sounded, definitely bipedal, as if it were tapping on drums from a long distance. It just got louder and louder until it stopped in front of me about 50 yards in a huge thicket before getting close. I remember standing up on the deer stand to give me more height because I knew what was coming. It was going to be monumental. Through the thicket, I can see it silhouetted at about a 45 degree angle, at least 4 feet wide and 8 to 9 feet tall. I don't know why, fear, I guess, but I immediately said. Hey, there's someone hunting here. It immediately snorted and huffed twice or three times like it was trying to smell me. It started running again, then stopped again. Frightened out of my mind, I yelled out, that's a good way to get shot. I heard the last stick break and the last thud of its weight. I jumped out of the stand, hit the swamp behind me and waded through the alligator infested waters to get to the levee to get back to town. The only way I could go back was through those woods. I knew that in less than a week I was moving to Maryland. Me and a buddy decided to camp out 200 yards or more from where that happened on the Mississippi River. We did this for 4 or 5 days. We were going to walk out along the Mississippi River one night and walk through the swamp and over the levee to a friend of mine's house to watch the movie Friday the 13th. Trying to keep it short, we'll meet two more of my friends at the house. We could hear them coming on the levee by three wheelers. We were just about to turn off the Mississippi River to go through the swamp when three bright lights appeared in the air. Everything fell silent, which is remarkable for a swamp at night. Yes, it was a UFO. Me and my buddy were standing there. I thought we would be abducted. This thing was 50 yards wide. Three glowing lights in a triangle formation, not shining on the ground but illuminating the treetops. It was on top of a levee 150 yards from us. It was not a light bouncing in the sky a mile away, not a glowing orb, but a huge UFO. I could have thrown a baseball and hit it. It turned in a circle and soared up about 50 feet and soared straight up like a lightning bolt. Some people claim that sometimes when Bigfoot sightings occur there are UFO sightings nearby, but this is where things get weird. Yes, I believe in Bigfoot 100%. It is my hope that I will never see one again. 100% I believe in UFOs and hope I don't encounter one again. I can't even tell these stories to my best friend without ridicule. I thought it would be funny if one could just walk up and smack the hell out of him while he hunted. I think there's something more sinister in the woods. Of all the stories I've heard of Bigfoot, I've never heard one make noise in another story like the one did with me. I'm wondering if it was a dog man. I did not see a snout nor a clear view of the face either. I have one that a friend shared with me and a few encounters I have heard about in my area. I also have had some weird things that have happened to me in the woods over the last few years. My name is Will. No one should feel the shame for experiencing something strange in the woods. I have a dog man story. One of my good friends shared with me. Our friend grew up here in Maryland with me and I've known her since high school. She lives out of state now but when she visits we always exchange hiking stories and things we see out in the woods. Her job involves her being out in the woods for days at a time, so she is very familiar with all the things out in nature. One day we're talking about weird stuff we have seen and heard in the woods. She told me something that shocked me. Let me preface this by saying she knows I'm interested in the Bigfoot topic and that I have experienced weird things. So. She felt comfortable telling me what happened to her. She told me while taking a trip to Southern Maryland to visit a college campus with her mom there's a spot in the road that people apparently see the ghost of a Civil War soldier cross the road. As they're getting closer the spot she said that a giant black dog ran across the road and in front of the car on all fours. She told me the dog's back was five feet off the ground. She said it happened so fast that her mind didn't register what had happened until they're further down the road. She asked her mom if she saw it too and she had no idea what she was talking about. 
If I'm not mistaken I think she got her mom to drive back to the spot where it crossed and she saw nothing. The crazy part of the story is I have never mentioned to her that people see these dogman cryptids. I completely trust her and believe her story. I showed her some pictures of dogman I've seen seen on the internet and that artists have drawn. She immediately pointed to one that looked like a black German shepherd. There's a river I go hiking along that has some terrifying encounters with the creature that looks like a hyena with a lion's mane. I pray to God before I go hiking here that I do not run into this thing. I haven't had any gut feelings telling me to leave or anything like, therefore I still go out doing what I love. Apparently, back in year 2003, men were waiting in the river while fishing. One day they went around a bend and saw this hyena type dog man in the river and it was drowning a deer. Then it apparently bluff charged the three men, then scooped up the deer with one arm and walked away into the woods on two legs. Travel further south down this river someone else was apparently chased on their dirt bike by another hyena type dog man and this happened only a few years ago. I wonder if it was the same one? It seems like if you follow this river north Bigfoot encounters happen near this wildlife refuge. I recently heard of a sighting where one of these things grabs someone and the guy passed out from fear. This apparently happened just a few miles away from where I'm sitting right now in an upper middle class area that is highly populated and there aren't that many areas that have woods anymore because of more houses being built. I personally believe their stories. There's a lot of reports of these things in Maryland. If you're interested Google Dwayo. This incident occurred during the winter of 2018. I'm a drawbridge operator located outside of a busy vacation town in Maryland's eastern shore on the Chesapeake Bay. During the summer the bridge opened up quite a bit when a vessel was making its way either in from or out to the ocean. We tried not to disrupt the flow of traffic too much so we would batch the requests together and open the bridge every 20 minutes or so. There's a coast guard station near the bridge and perimeter is heavily fenced off. Apparently, they took trespassing incidents seriously. The winter traffic was minimal and the bridge might only open three or four times a day to accommodate the few commercial fishermen in the area. It was a very cold winter day in January when this incident took place. I had just started my shift. I was on nights for the next two weeks I was going over the previous operator's log notes. On the outbound log I noticed that the big coast guard cutter, along with a bunch of their smaller boats and the two tugs that they had had come through the bridge. I was a little bit of a surprise as it would take a few dozen people to man all of those craft, and it being winter that was quite unusual. There had been no May Day or distress calls broadcast so I figured that the Coast Guard conducted some kind of a drill or exercise. Later into my shift, and for some unknown reason, I missed a first call over the radio. As soon as I realized it I asked for them to repeat their message. It was the captain of that big Coast Guard cutter. I was told that the bridge needed to be opened in exactly 13 minutes and then it would need to stay open until I was given directions to lower it. This wouldn't have been an issue since fewer than six cars had crossed the bridge all night but military and law enforcement were entitled to passage through the canal as they needed it. They called in with the ETA so when the time got close I logged the communication and I opened the bridge. Looking out over the water I could start to see the bow lights of a small fleet of ships. It would end up being six in total including the cutter, two tugboats, and three other small craft. The smaller vessels were paced out about 500 feet behind the cutter. Directly behind the cutter were the two tugboats almost side by side. The operator room was about 70 or 80 feet away from where the bridge opened but there was a camera system which constantly recorded the area around and beneath the bridge. As the cutter passed beneath the bridge and passed one of the cameras I could make out a few dozen people aboard the craft. I couldn't believe it at first but about half of them were holding assault rifles. Then the tugboats came next. It was the middle of the night and water visibility here is poor but I could just make out the thick tow ropes trailing into the water behind the tugs and attached to them was something unbelievably long. It was hard to tell but whatever it was looked smooth with a greenish hue. 
I could see a scaly texture and just by how much time it took for the creature to pass by the camera I guess that it was at least 200 feet long. I'm not even sure that I saw the end of it before what happened next. I'm not positive if it was because of the lights on the bridge or the underwater noise of the props bouncing off the nearby concrete, but the long thing started moving slowly. It was kind of swaying back and forth beneath the bridge. One of the guys on the tugboat started yelling out loud and I could see the small craft was straining to maintain its straight path. The three smaller boats in the back started gunning in towards the tugs kicking up tons of wake. The water started churning violently throughout the canal in an area a few hundred feet long. On camera I could see that one of the tow cables from a tugboat snapped and now that it was no longer restrained. The tug shot forward slamming into one of the bridge pilings. I heard a quick round of pops followed by another and I ran over to the door of the office and pushed it open. From my vantage point I could see the small boats in the rear of the convoy speeding up to the tugs but giving the erupting water a wide berth. Suddenly, several of the guys started shooting at that long creature in the water. The other tug, now bearing the full burden, was getting dragged across the surface. At one or two points it looked like it might even dip beneath the water. The cutter was trying hard to come around but the bridge didn't give it any room. It was hard to tell how it happened but somehow the line from the other tug snapped just as a massive snake-like tail erupted out of the water near one of the smaller boats, slamming down on the edge of it. This caused it to tip. There was a minute of total chaos. A few of the crew were floating in the water. The gunshot stopped but the shouts continued for at least a minute longer. One of the other boats went to pick up the floating crew of the tipped boat and the other craft fell back into the loose semi-formation. The convoy then headed in the direction of the Coast Guard station. The creature or whatever it was didn't resurface again. I dropped the bridge and I just plopped into my seat at the desk. I was trying to figure out what had happened. A few minutes later, a black SUV drove over the bridge and stopped right in front of the operating room. Two men got out of the vehicle and they walked right in without knocking. One was wearing a US Coast Guard uniform and carrying an assault rifle. The other man was wearing a style of uniform that I didn't recognize. This man introduced himself as a US Navy captain, name withheld. He told me to recount the events that I had just witnessed. So I did. He then asked a bunch of questions, like if I had recorded anything or contacted anybody. I told him no, but that the bridge utilized a camera system. He finished by telling me that I was relieved for the night and that I should get a call from my supervisor soon that would confirm it. I didn't say anything else. I grabbed my stuff and I headed home. My supervisor did call me while I was driving. He sounded just as confused as me but he told me that I had the next week off with double pay. He called back a few days later and he told me that a new position for a higher paying administrative job at another location had just opened and refusal wasn't an option. So, here I am now working that new job. I don't know if I can get in trouble for repeating any of this but I guess I will soon find out. I know it sounds like complete BS but it really did happen. I live in Knightsville, South Carolina. The first incident happened on November 29, 2021 at around 11.30 p.m. I'm a single mom. I struggled to sleep that night with a severe migraine. I woke up from a dream and felt like there was something in my room. My daughter slept in my bed with me and I hid us both under a blanket. She stayed asleep the whole night, including during this visitation. I was under the blanket when I suddenly felt a finger pressed down on my forehead between my eyes. It wasn't a small finger, it was as if a large man pressed his finger between my eyes. I started to panic and reluctantly reached out from the blanket to grab my cell phone beside my bed and called my mom. I was really scared and needed to talk to someone. My mom answered the phone, but the call abruptly ended. When I peeked out of my blanket, I saw something in front of me. I could tell something was in front of me, but it looked like a mirage. I couldn't see through it, but I could see something was there. I started panicking even more. 
I told myself that I was seeing things and reached my hand out to prove there was nothing there. I was wrong, and I grabbed onto a thin arm. That really freaked me out, so I again dialed my mom but the phone was dead and wouldn't turn itself on. It was plugged into the charger wire so this made no sense at all. Suddenly, I was back into a dream state and a character from a TV show that I enjoyed was standing in front of me trying to calm me down. But I felt like this being was just appearing as something I liked. Then I fell asleep again and dreamed that my daughter and I were on a beach. I looked down into a tide pool on the beach and saw some red and blue tiger's eye stones, so I picked them up and put them in my pocket. When I woke up again, I checked my phone and it had been charged, and the time was 4 am. My migraine was completely gone. The next day, I felt weird and lethargic for the entire day. I believed that I was traumatized, but it was not scary. I didn't feel threatened or hurt. It just frightened me to wake up from a dream and see what was happening. I'm not sure how to explain it. However, as soon as the finger touched my forehead, I saw in my mind's eye that it was a long gray finger. Can you explain what happened to me? I later had a dream that an alien gray had come into my bedroom, but it was brief and I'm positive that it was just a dream. My daughter now has her own bedroom. Recently, she has described a green wavy man visiting her at night. She remembers three separate visitations. I set up a video camera in her room, but on the nights when she experiences visits the camera doesn't record anything. She says that she isn't frightened by the visitor, but I'm very concerned. My most beloved uncle committed S in 91. We were stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington and had no phone so the state police and a chaplain came and delivered the news. Had to move through military channels to pull my husband out of the field in Yakima. My mother had to pay bank to get us on Delta, and home, Kentucky, in time. We landed about an hour before the service, so you can imagine how exhausted we were. I hadn't really slept in three days. This man was my father. He was our patriarch. We muddled through the service and returned to his and my aunt's house. My husband was devastated and tore ass through a healthy amount of beam. Got my aunt sedated and in bed, went outside to comfort my man. He's in the tree swing and I'm trying to soothe or drag his ass in cause I am beyond wore out. Let me interject here that I have had a bizarre fascination slash fear of UFOs and aliens my whole life. My fam lived in the country way away from civilization, and there were nights I drove home in the middle of the night, leaving their house speeding to get to city lights. My cousin was a little prick who would wait until bedtime, I always got his room when I, I came, and say hey, Martianus, hope your friends don't come visit tonight. Aliens. He thought my fear was hilarious. My uncle on the other hand, was intrigued by my duality about the subject. Coming full circle here, as I'm cajoling hubby, a UFO appears above the farmhouse. Not an army flare, an airliner, nor a Chinook, not fireworks. This thing was huge, pulsating an odd orange and red glow. I fa reeked the F out for a second ran in and got smart ass cousin, who was young and as sober as I was. Hubby met us at the back door and we piled out into the yard. I felt the biggest sense of calm come over me, and oddly enough, cousin, who never believed and ridiculed, came unglued. It just hovered for like 15 minutes and just gradually floated and dimmed out over the pastures until we could no longer see it. I believe my uncle came to say goodbye to me and help me allay my fears. My cousin has never yanked my chain again. My name is Alex. I'd like to tell you a true story that happened to me at work. Back in 2013, I briefly worked in a furniture manufacturing warehouse for six months. We mass produced wall units that held your TV, VCR, and stereo all in one unit. Me and about 10 other people were hired to work the 4 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. shift to cut, drill and package the particle board. The customer would then assemble the entertainment center at home. The person in charge of the shift, I forget his name, 
was a co-worker in his mid-twenties with long light brown hair, about 5 foot 8 inches tall, looked like he worked out with weights, was quiet, did his job well, was a nice guy. He kind of looked like Heath Ledger, the actor. About three months after working there, I came into work like any other day. At lunchtime, I was at the workstation by myself eating my lunch when the person in charge of the shift came up to me and asked if he could talk to me. For the next 15 minutes, I had the most profound experience of my life while he talked to me. This individual that doesn't know me anywhere, except work, started telling me things about myself with pinpoint accuracy. Things that nobody else, but me, could understand. How could he know things about me that I have experienced in the past that only I could understand? He was not cold reading me, like a palm reader would. He said exact occurrences. It was a very strange situation. Lunch time was over and we all returned back to work. For the next three months, he was there every day, working as usual like nothing ever happened. After three months, there was a work shortage and everybody from the evening shift got laid off. I never saw him again. I later moved from the East Coast to California. About a year ago, I met a guy at a get-together at a friend's house who, I swear, was the same guy. It was so weird. His name was Michael. I asked my friend about Michael and he said that he knew him from his job. A few weeks later, I went to lunch with the same friend and Michael was with him. Instantly, Michael started recalling things from my past. I asked him if we had ever met before, but he insisted that we hadn't. Recently, my friend told me that Michael had suddenly quit his job. When he tried to contact him, he was nowhere to be found. I wonder, was Michael a doppelganger or the same guy from before? It's just so strange. The creepiest time I have ever had in the wilderness was when I was being followed by what I assume was a homeless man or drifter. Now I wasn't like miles away from civilization, but I was on a local parks path about 45 minutes from the parking lot. My wife and I were at a point where the amount of people was very slim. So we stopped for a drink of water at our halfway point, and across the canal I can see a guy in a jacket, full-length pants, and he has a sack with him probably full of human heads. It is like 90 degree weather, so to see someone in that outfit is fairly weird, let alone carrying a sack in the middle of the wilderness. I could see the guy looking at us, and I decided that we needed to head back to the car. So my wife and I start walking back, when I decide to peek back about 5 minutes later, and the drifter is about 100 yards behind us. I have no clue how he got across the canal. Although my wife would later find out there was a small pipe he could have crossed, but at this time I thought he was super drifter or something, so we keep walking, and I would casually peek behind us every now and then, the drifter was always the same distance behind us. At one point a guy on a mountain bike comes ripping around the corner of the path, and directly at the drifter. He skids to a stop and they start having an argument. Their argument ends with the guy on the bike yelling at the drifter to get a job, then he pedals off. I decided that we needed to walk faster, so I tell my wife to pick it up, hopefully that will give us some distance from the drifter. I look back a couple minutes later and the drifter is about the same distance from us. I'm really confused at this point, because my wife and I are not slow walkers at all, we both are runners and have good stamina or speed. This drifter in his full pants slash jacket carrying a sack in 90 degree weather is keeping up with us. At this point I am beyond freaked out, so I tell my wife to pick it up even more. We are going at a very fast walk pace, I would say it was comparable to jogging, but in walking form. Every time I look back the drifter is about the same amount of distance from me. Eventually we start to see people on the path and I just hope that the drifter decides he wants to stop and talk to one of those people, but he never does, he just keeps following us. We make it back to where we parked our car, it only took us 30 minutes to get back to our car. As we get in the car, dripping in sweat, we drive away and see the drifter emerge onto the sidewalk in town.
I was probably 21 because I was sharing an apartment with my sister and that would make her 18. It was in Thousand Oaks. The apartment was on the third floor and we always had a bunch of friends over. It was pretty much the party apartment. So we had a bunch of friends over like once a week and we would do Ouija. I didn't have a board so what I did was, I made one. I got a big piece of cloth, like t-shirt material, jersey. I drew all the letters on it and made all the designs and I created a Ouija board. And I had like a glass ashtray. A small glass ashtray that we could use as a pointer. So the ashtray would just go over the letters and we could see through. So we had a lot of fun with it. We'd ask silly questions just for the first few times. Everybody would ask questions and it was a lot of fun and everybody had a good time. And then one night we had an entity come through. God, I don't even like to say his name because it still freaks me out to this day, but he called himself AJ. And he would just at first just kind of play around with us. You know, I think he was just kind of stringing us all along, kind of thing. We would ask who he was, when was he alive? How did he die, you know, those kind of things. And he told us that he died in a school bus accident and all of the kids in the bus died and we were like, ooh. We were getting kind of creeped out by that and he said he felt so guilty about it and it was his fault. I know it's hard to think that you could get that kind of information from a Ouija board but I mean this was over time and so my sister and I tried to investigate. We didn't have an area but we assumed it was from the local area and we tried to investigate. We couldn't find any news stories about a major school bus incident like that. We looked at the local cemetery to see if we could see his name there. We couldn't find anything. So it got to the point where the friends would come over and this entity would always come through. We were like, we don't want to talk to you. We want to talk to somebody else. It just got to be, you know. It was starting to freak us out. So we were thinking how do we get rid of this guy and then all of a sudden then he started coming to me in my dreams. So now I'm getting really tripped out. I'm like, I said to my sister, her name was Crystal. I'm like Crystal we have got to get rid of this Ouija board. He's starting to come into my dreams. We gotta get this thing out of the house. It's a bad entity or whatever. I didn't ever see him in my dream. It was like he was talking to me in my dream and he told me his name so that's how I knew who he was but I didn't see him. It was just really freaky and bizarre and scary because I'm thinking, if we can not only come through a Ouija board, of course, you know, I'm not thinking sensible, of course he come through anything. If he can come through the Ouija board, of course he can come into my thoughts or what have you. Jimmy Church asks if they ever found out who he was. We never found out who he was and we decided to get rid of the Ouija board. So we took the Ouija board and we threw it into the big apartment dumpster out back. We just threw it away. And we were like no more oh ow eyeing. No more. We'll do something else. We'll have the friends over for a party but we're not gonna Ouija anymore. So, like a week later, my sister and I are in the kitchen and we're cooking and I said get me the blah blah or whatever out, what I was asking for and she goes to the drawer to pull it out and there, folded up in the drawer is. Guess what? I am serious. She's like, Maria, look in the drawer. I'm like, how is it there? How did it get there? We threw it out. How did it get there? We ended up burning it. We were so freaked out. So scared. That was the end of it. Once I burned it, that was it. On or about September 25, 1973, I was enrolled in a doctoral course that met from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at Baylor University. This course met two nights a week. After class, I was driving west for home when I noticed a bright light above Lake Waco. At first, I thought it was the planet Venus. However, as I continued to drive toward the lake as I lived on the west side of town, I noticed that the light was appearing more and more to my right. So I knew it wasn't but it was probably a helicopter. Two nights later as I drove home from class, I noticed the same light again. Since I wasn't sure if it was a helicopter or something else, I thought I would check it out. Instead of returning home, 
I drove over the bridge at Lake Waco and took the first exit to the right. This led to Spiegelville Park. I could see the craft was on the west side of the lake in a stationary position with a white light pointing east. As I approached the craft, it turned off the light and moved to the southwest. I could tell it was a black triangular craft. It crossed the highway, and I followed it. I got back on the highway and watched the craft cross over the highway and settled behind a clump of trees on the south side of the highway. I then took the next exit and crossed over on an overpass to the area where I saw the craft go down. I could not see the craft as I drove slowly past the trees. The road curved back east, and I pulled up about 100 yards, turned off my lights but left the engine running. Looking in my rear view mirror after a few moments, I saw it slowly rise from the trees and come toward where I was parked. It then pulled up to where I was on the other side of the fence. It turned to face me and remained motionless, making no sound. It was on the other side of what appeared to be a telephone line about 10 feet above it. I could definitely tell that the craft was black, triangular in shape, about 20 feet wide and 30 feet long. It had a cockpit with a greenish hue inside, and I could see the shadows of three small heads peering down at me. After about 4 to 5 minutes, a green light appeared on my vehicle causing the engine to die. I tried to restart it without success. I tried turning on my lights and radio, but nothing worked. Getting nervous, I locked my door. I sat there for a good 15 to 20 minutes, trying every 2 to 3 minutes to start my engine. Finally, the engine turned over, and I drove down the road about another 100 yards where I put on my lights and turned around. As I drove past the craft on my left, it hadn't moved. When I got back on the highway heading east, I could see it was still there. About three years later, I saw what appeared to be the same craft above the lights at the south end of the La Vega football field. It was apparently observing a football game. My family and I headed to my wife's family for dinner. And I wanted to drive over and show her what I had seen years earlier, but she didn't want to see. Having served two years in AFROTC and two years in the US Army with a top secret clearance, I can say without a doubt that this craft was not ours. I used to work in South Africa doing wildlife work and on a normal day I typically was out in the bush by myself. The area that I was working had the highest density of African leopards in South Africa. And when I started working there I was told you will probably never see a leopard, but a leopard will probably see you every day. This was kind of a creepy thought in its own right, but it didn't really bother me at all. We had some trail cameras set up in the area to catch photos of wildlife, and they obviously caught any people that would walk by as well. One day one of the other researchers called me over and showed me a picture of myself walking past a game camera and less than a minute later a large leopard walked past the camera going in the opposite direction, coming from the direction I was walking towards. He must have heard me coming and just ducked off into some bushes for a second, watched me pass and continued on his way. I had no idea. So I spent a lot of time hunting and fishing in some of the more rural areas of North Carolina. I have seen graveyards that date back to colonial times in central to western parts of North Carolina that you would assume were too far from the coast to be settled. I have had experiences in houses that predate the 1890s, as far back as we can trace, that would definitely make you believe in ghosts but the strangest and most frightening experience I have had was when I witnessed what I could only assume to be ball lighting last bow season. Last year in September my brother, his girlfriend and myself moved into a nice older house that is on 13 acres of property. Being avid bow hunters the first thing we did was hang a ladder stand on the most obvious deer trail and drop a corn pile and camera nearby. Flash forward to mid-October. We've been seeing a good amount of deer on our camera and are super excited to take turns sitting in the stand. One afternoon my brother and his girlfriend are leaving to visit her family that lives just a few miles down the road. I decide to take the opportunity to hunt. The leaves are falling and everything is orange in the woods. 
Right at dark in the fleeting moments of legal shooting light I hear the unmistakable sound of deer moving towards me. What I mean by unmistakable is that deer typically walk so cautious they barely make any sound at all often stepping g lightly enough that you would think it was an animal much smaller as size until they break a branch. It's the trained deer aspect that other hunters would be familiar with. It's getting darker and darker and typically I would climb down but these deer are shadows right on top of me now. I hesitated because I didn't want to alert them in hopes of coming back and catching them in the act earlier at some point in time. I'm watching these sleek long shadows when bam all of a sudden the woods lights up with this glow. In retrospect it's hard to describe exactly what happened or what I saw but it looked precisely like what a lighting bug looks like in the distance except on a much larger scale. A bright green flame like ball the size of a dinner plate. Hell maybe even bigger just lit up four feet off the ground right underneath me. I waited for the deer to explode through the woods but early they didn't. As a matter of fact they vanished almost like transported. Just gone. The light itself only illuminated for a few seconds and then complete darkness. Needless to say I waited another three hours for my brother to come looking for me pulling up in his truck worried. There was no way I was leaving the safety of that tree stand until someone came and I wasn't alone. Ha! Huh. Crazy! My brother passed away about seven years ago on March 22nd. Sometimes I have visitation dreams from him where we sit and talk. I hadn't had one in a while. Back in late March of 2015, not on the 22nd, I happened to have another one. In the dream, we were sitting somewhere talking. During the dream he put his hand on my shoulder and at that moment I woke up. I realized I had to take a leak, so I got up walked into the bathroom, switched on the light and looked in the mirror. On my arm, where he had touched me in the dream was a large bruise. And right above it was his first initial written in pen just above the bruise. I don't have any pens in my bedroom, and I am not a sleepwalker and I am not on any medication. The bruise didn't hurt at all and faded within a few days. I have no idea how to explain what happened. My heroin addiction hit rock bottom back in May or June of this year. I ended up not being able to pay my rent, so I pawned off almost all of my possessions, and before I could piss every cent of it away I decided to buy some basic camping supplies. A tent, a fire starter, parachute cord, knives, snare wire, etc. Because I knew it would be impossible to live out of my car in the summer heat. I ended up doing a kind of hybrid thing where I would spend a few days out in the woods, then go back to my car to pawn some more of my shit and score dope or food. The point is, I was wandering off into the woods at night without any real idea of what I was doing. I would usually try to go a mile or so in so that I wouldn't be in as much danger of being on anyone's property and getting arrested. However, this was harder than I imagined it would be. The woods near the trails I grew up wandering, which had acres of land separating them from any homes, had become a victim of the McMansion developments that sliced into forests all across the nation. So I would often find myself in an area I thought was desolate, only to realize that there were houses one-eighth of a mile or so away. Whenever this happened, I was always afraid some kid would go running into the woods to play in the early morning, see me, and then rush to his parents who would undoubtedly call the police about the six feet two unshaven stranger sleeping on their property with two giant knives, military grade rope, and snare wires. Like I said, I didn't know what the F I was doing, so I often found myself hiking through the woods long after nightfall, swinging my machete blindly and struggling to assemble my tent with one hand. While I held my phone's flashlight in the other, that is, until I pawned my iPhone too. It was one of those nights, well into the evening by the time I set out, and I had tried to make it a point to go much further into the forest than usual. Due to the aforementioned fear of being caught near those housing developments. I finally decided I had hiked far enough. I was looking for a large open clearing that used to spook me as a kid, but now seemed like the ideal place to set up camp. 
Looking back, I'm guessing it was a grow up, but at the time, the abandoned minivan with creepy word spray painted on the side filled to the brim with peat moss was rather unsettling. The woods were very dense, so clearings were difficult to come by, and I had to take what I could get. Unfortunately, I had no luck finding the place, but by the time I was certain I had gone too far, 11 to 12, I figured at least I was far away from the housing developments to not have to worry about the cops. I was shining my phone's flashlight around, and I spotted a very small clearing a few hundred feet from the trail. I went over to it, and realized it was a fairly thick patch of moss on top of a rocky surface. I figured it would have to do, so I struggled and cursed my way through the process of setting up a tent in the pitch black night. It was almost 1 am by the time I finally lay down to sleep. At first I was on my side facing right, but when I tossed over to my left, 4 inches of moss is hardly a tempur and the withdrawals weren't making my situation any better, I saw something strange. Through my tent, I was able to see a single point of light in the distance. I couldn't quite tell the source or where it was, but my first guess was that it was a flashlight on the trail since it was definitely bright enough for me to have seen it when I was setting up camp. As I stared at it, however, I noticed that it didn't seem to be moving. That meant that whoever's light it was was either standing still or else moving parallel to my eye line. I continued to stare at it, and it continued to remain the exact same size, which meant it wasn't moving towards or away from me. I stared at it for 5 minutes, and the only thing I could come up with was that it was a backyard porch light for one of the newly built houses. Thing was, as I stared at it, I got the impression that it was moving ever so slightly, just barely enough to pick up on. After a half an hour of this, I convinced myself that I must have not noticed the house due to the time I arrived, and I was content enough with that explanation to be able to fall asleep. However, when I awoke the next morning, just as I had originally thought, I was in the middle of nowhere, probably a mile from the nearest house. My time slip story happened in the summer of 1987. One night, I experienced something that enabled me to see the world through someone else's eyes for no longer than a minute. It scared me senseless at the time and I have no explanation for the events all those years ago. The backstory is this, my then girlfriend, we'll call her Helen, lived in a big, former vicarage built around the 1800s, in a small village in Yorkshire, UK, some miles from my hometown. Her father was a wealthy guy who worked for the government. He bought the house for the family to live in a couple of years earlier and renovated it to bring it back to its former glory. One August weekend Helen had the house to herself. Her brother and parents were somewhere else. She decided to have a small party. I was instructed to bring my buddy Tim along. It seemed that one of her friends had a thing for him and really wanted to meet him. So the party was me and Tim, my girlfriend and three of her mates from university, one of whom was the reason my friend was reluctantly set up to meet. Okay so the scene has been set, we turn up with a large quantity of beer and attitude. I did my part by bringing Tim along to meet the girl. However, he then got drunk and embarrassed, and failed to fulfill his expected role of sweeping this very pretty, but rather dull young woman off her feet. He wasn't concerned about romance and enjoyed himself in his own way. We were 20 and that night beer and silliness took over. It was a night I will never forget. By midnight, the girls were all in Helen's bedroom doing what girls do when things happen. They were ganging up together and probably having a group anti-men therapy session. At this point Tim and I were ready to find somewhere to fall into deep sleep. We decided to worry about facing these disappointed women in the morning. I wasn't drunk, but I drunk enough beer and didn't want to drive us home. I suggested we find a bed somewhere in this sprawling rambling old house. Now imagine a house with maybe 12 rooms upstairs. I knew the door to the bathroom and to Helen's room, but every other door was a mystery. Tim and I walked to the end of a passage and pushed open a door. The room was empty except for two small ancient iron beds squeezed against the wall and a few packing crates. 
There was no carpet on the floor and no other furniture. It was like a small store room but there were beds and we weren't too fussy. In our sleepy state, we just fell asleep. The next thing I knew, I was sitting up in bed, looking out of the window opposite. The window had five bars, upright bars like an old jail. The sun was streaming into the room and it was blinding me. Outside the window, I could clearly see the branches of a large tree as they moved in what seemed to be a very windy morning. The next thing I realized was that the room was filled with furniture, very old-fashioned furniture. It seemed like a nursery with a rocking horse in the corner, but there was no ceiling electric light. Not sure why I looked up but I did and remembered there was no light. As I tried to make sense of where I was, I could hear people moving outside the room. I could also hear the distinct sound of china cups and plates chinking as people carried and served food. I tried to get out of my bed but I was totally paralyzed from the waist down. My legs wouldn't move, and I panicked. I looked to my right and there was no other bed, snoring Tim. I was terrified. A door opened and a young woman walked into the room. She started speaking to me but no sound came out of her mouth. She was dressed like a servant from a period movie, there was no kindness or smiles. She came in and spoke to me, no idea what she said, and then left. At this point I was shaking like a leaf and trying to figure out what to do next. I remember thinking I should check the time. I looked down at my watch and everything went dark. I could hear snoring and my digital watch showed it was 3.10 am. Wherever I had been, I was back where I needed to be. I leapt out of bed, felt for the light switch and turned it on. Everything was 1987 again, confirmed by the language from Tim who was woken up by the light. The rest of the night passed without incident. First thing in the morning I was awoken, again, by the sunlight streaming through the window. This time there were no bars on the window, no tree limbs bending the shafts of light that streamed into the room. It was just an ordinary window. I went downstairs, leaving Tim to sleep. Once the girls had poured me a coffee, I took it outside into the large garden. I needed to see where the tree had gone, the tree that I saw so clearly a few hours before. Helen and her friends followed me outside and I explained what had happened, that I had seen a huge old tree and bars on the window. The tree was gone. No tree stump anywhere near the building. I saw the small window of our room. And then we saw a rather hungover Tim smiling weakly, waving from the same window, who had heard us talking outside in the garden. The story might have ended there. I believe that for a short period of maybe 30 to 45 seconds I swapped places with a former occupant of that room, at a time when there was no electric light, bars on the window, an old tree beyond the window and a rather unhappy servant whose voice was on mute. After I told Helen everything, she went quiet and said nothing. Have you ever been to my dad's study? I answered that I had not. She said follow me and we walked into a downstairs room where her dad worked and had his den. He collected documents and photographs from the house's history, to help him and the architect renovate it to its former glory. She pointed out a set of five old sepia photographs, which were framed on the wall. The earliest dated from about 1880, through maybe 10 years, judging by the ages of the children, of presumably the same family. It shows the resident, the local vicar, sitting in the garden with his wife and family. He was dressed in Victorian dresses, sailor suits and starched collars. There were, I think, eight children and one was in an ancient wheelchair. They were all arranged in front of a huge oak tree, behind which the window of our time slip room clearly had bars. The boy in the wheelchair looked about 12 and was clearly very disabled. He didn't appear in any of the later photos on the wall. So that's my story. People will say, yeah, the guy had been drinking, I had, but no amount of German beer and Marlboros, there were no drugs involved, would cause me to experience what I did. The weirdest thing about the whole event was that it felt hyper real, like everything was turned up on ATV, contrast, brightness, color, everything except the volume on the grumpy servant. I will never forget how terrifying the whole thing was to me. I haven't had anything like that happen to me again, 
nor do I want to repeat it. My experience left me fascinated by the time slip stories that I know you enjoy. However, I had a genuine wish to never again pass through whatever dimensional or time space curtain exists, and it really does exist. I live in Iowa and during the Perseid meteor shower, I decided to drive out of town to get a good look without the light pollution. I found a nice gravel road and sat down in my lawn chair with a beer to enjoy the show. After about an hour, I hear footsteps walking toward me on the gravel road. There were no houses for several miles from where I was. I could see a form of a very hairy man walking towards me. I yelled to him in a friendly voice to let him know what I was doing and received no answer. Greeted him again, no answer. When he was about 20 yards away, he started to dig and I saw red glowing eyes. I noped right the F out of there. In the brake lights I could see a form. But no detail. I was staying in a large folly, in this case a fake castle Peckforton in the UK if you want to look it up. Anyways a bunch of us were supposed to leave the site in the evening and go for a drink in the local pub. I was told the van taking us would be down by the main gate. S off I walked. It's about half mile downhill through the woods. By the time I got to the gatehouse down by the road, it was nearly pitch black and they were long gone. So I waited for a bit just in case and then started the walk back up to the castle. After a couple of minutes I just got the feeling of being watched, I looked behind me and on the path I thought maybe there was something the size of a cat, maybe. I carried on walking freaking out a little bit. I looked back again and now there was maybe five things on the path. Maybe I sped up and then I heard noise there was definitely something following me it was in the woods on both sides of the path. I looked behind again just as the moon came out from the clouds and there were the shapes on the paths and the trees these grey lumps, dozens and dozens of them. I just ran I heard them scuffling and scratching as they ran. But sheer terror gave me a huge amount of speed and I left them in the dark and ran into the castle, never have I been more pleased to see people. When I was a child I was out hunting with my father deep in the Appalachian woods. It was getting late afternoon when we ran across what appeared to be an old overgrown logging road of some sort. We followed it up a hill and around a bend to find it blocked by a large fallen tree. We heard a terrible crashing sound from the part of the road we just came up and saw two very large black cat-like animals racing side by side up the road. I'd never seen anything like it before or since. They were sleek and all black, not making any sounds but their feet. My dad threw me behind the fallen tree and set himself up with his rifle aiming back the way we came but these animals never appeared. We never saw them again or heard the go off into the woods at all. Could this be crawlers? A park ranger who's been doing this a long time. He told me about an incident while escorting some boy scouts out of the park at dark. To get them to their cars, he had to cross a creek that was roughly four feet deep and just over three feet wide. As he approached the water's edge with his flashlight, there were large sounds from both sides of him, growling from up in the surrounding cliffs. It sounded something like a big bear and a wolf, but much deeper. He told me it was the scariest thing he's ever heard. Even though they weren't exactly close, he knew whatever it was sounded big and it was not going to let him pass without taking a swipe at him or potentially chasing him off. So. He angled his flashlight beam to light up the water's surface, shouted at the boys crossing, stay away from the edge of the creek. Hurry or we'll be here all night. They got across safely by jumping, and as soon as they were out of sight, he heard a loud crashing sound in front of him. He kept shining his light straight away but never saw anything. He got to just that whatever it was, it was trying to stay hidden in the darkness. He didn't think much about it though until a few years later when I asked if he's ever seen anything creepy after dark. He said, no way whatsoever. I've been doing this for years, and there is something very spooky about that stretch of land, especially past sunset. In fact, 
that following summer, yet another ranger was going to check on a family, a mom, dad, and son, all hikers. He thought they were still out near the same area. When he got close enough to their campsite, he saw all three sets of tent footprints coming across the creek but only one set going back into the woods. He found them all dead, and he had to write down that it was an attempted mauling by a bear, but they had been partially eaten. Even that boy scout troop leader said what he saw resembled what looked to be a large wolf, and he believes it's the infamous Michigan dogman. Anyway, you really don't want to go camping in these parts at night. The woods just are not really safe anymore. I never expected my investigation into the mysterious disappearances along that notorious stretch of highway in Texas would lead me to such a chilling encounter. As a journalist, I was used to delving into stories with an open mind, but what I encountered on that dark and unsettling night would forever change the way I saw the world. Armed with my notepad and a determination to uncover the truth, I found myself standing alone on the side of the desolate highway. The night was draped in a shroud of darkness, the only source of light being the distant glow of my camera's red recording light. I needed to gather first-hand accounts, and my plan was to hitch a ride with one of the long-haul truckers who frequented this forsaken road. After waiting for what felt like an eternity, a rumbling engine approached, and the glaring headlights of an 18-wheeler pierced through the darkness. I waved my arms, hoping the trucker would notice my distress signal and stop. The massive vehicle slowed to a halt just ahead of me, and the driver rolled down the window. He had a rugged appearance, weathered by countless miles on the road, and his eyes bore stories of the highway that lay before him. Need a ride, partner? The trucker asked, his voice carrying a hint of caution. I explained that I was a journalist investigating the strange occurrences along the highway, hoping he might have some insight. Surprisingly, the trucker seemed willing to talk, although not about the missing persons. Instead, he leaned closer and hesitated for a moment before he began recounting his own eerie experience. It was a few months back, the trucker started. I was driving late into the night when I saw something I can't explain. There, in the distance, under the moonlight, was a creature unlike anything I've ever seen before. Intrigued, I listened intently as he described the creature. It was probably about eight feet tall, kind of dark gray with a little brown, he said, trying to conjure the image in his memory. It had a mane, sort of like a male lion, but with shorter hair around the body and legs. The most unsettling part was that it was walking upright on its back legs, like a man. I scribbled furiously in my notepad, trying to capture every detail of his encounter. The trucker continued, I tried to follow it, you know, just out of sheer curiosity, but it moved with incredible speed. Before I knew it, it vanished into the woods by the side of the road. I couldn't help but feel a shiver crawl up my spine as he recounted his experience. Was it possible that this mysterious creature was somehow connected to the disappearances? The thought sent a chill down my spine. In 2000, I worked in a branch of Navy that dealt with intel and advanced bio-research. On September 12, 2000, we got word that we were to go on a deep expedition 329 miles south off the coast of Maui, in search of a supposed sunken fleet of ships that had mysteriously vanished back in the 1970s but was ultimately covered up from the press. Nobody except certain branches of the military even knew about it. Researchers in that area had detected some very unique sonar signatures that could be nothing but man-made metal objects at record-breaking depths of about 5,200 meters. Before I get too far into the story, let me start with some background information. You should probably use I'm 38 years old at the time of this story. I had just got out of the Navy after serving for six years, having already gotten an early discharge because of my outstanding service. I'm only sharing this with you because I want you to know that I'm very intelligent, and I know this story is going to sound outlandish to a civilian like you. I had been stationed on the USS Glacier in Antarctica for two years, and when I finished my tour, 
I was assigned to the U.S. Navy's underwater bio research lab. I had a position parallel to a few members on the team. I was officially their security officer, but they had me doing anything from feeding the dolphins to recording and entering in data. I basically had free reign at the lab, which was not a normal thing. My career in the Navy was built on my knowledge of wildlife, which is why I was assigned to the Antarctica mission where I did a center service that I cannot talk about what I did. I guess I had better get to the story. A few months before our mission, I was assigned to escort a scientist who was gathering water samples for research. I didn't like the guy because he had no regard for me or my time, and when we were coming up to the port after a few days at sea, he failed to reattach the anchor line, and we drifted out too far away from our ship. I had to call in divers for that ship to hook us back up. The scientist was humiliated, and I didn't care much. We got a distressed call from our sister's ship, the USS Berg, around midnight, which was two days into our expedition. Before we could even get to the area, apparently a man had gone overboard, and the Berg had lost visual contact with him. They sounded off the alarm, and 20 of us immediately began to scour the area for any signs he was missing. For about an hour, when he showed up at the surface, he was in a state of shock and wasn't talking much. One week went by, I guess, before he could speak in complete sentences, but during this time, he developed a sudden illness that progressed to the point where he was unable to speak altogether. He eventually passed away. We still don't know why. The research we were doing off the coast of Maui was meant to identify and locate these three ships that had vanished in the fall of 1972. They were now believed to have sunk in this perimeter. My job was to lead a small team into the deeper sections of the ocean with high-resolution sonar equipment, which required me to be on a submersible vessel and locate the crash site. Our team got out to the location at hand and began our submersion. The type of vessel we were in was a small sub capable of holding no more than seven of us comfortably. The maximum depth it can go was roughly 6,500 meters, but the only thing we were interested in at this time was right around the 5,200 meter mark. That's where our equipment was getting a reading from, so we all knew or speculated that this was the hot spot. The sub was able to travel at speeds of up to five knots, and we had a large sonar array that could detect objects up to 500 meters in front of us. We begin our descent, all of us on board were pretty ecstatic about our findings and that everything would be grand once we got deep enough to trace the location. That was until we got roughly to the 4,300 meter mark. At this depth, we lost all of our forward scanning abilities, and that was the first time I felt uneasy about this whole thing. We started to slowly sink. Our systems were malfunctioning, and there appeared to be some sort of electronic interference with our equipment. How could this be possible at such depths? There was no way that our signal could be interfered with at dips like these. To make sense of something so strange, our front lights were operating the entire time, but some of our systems were alive and active, but our propulsions were not operating. After some success of maybe 30 minutes, everything seemed to be operating smoothly again, and we continued our descent down to around the 5,200 meter mark where the ocean floor rested. We had finally arrived at the required depths, and we were now thoroughly scanning the floor for any sign or trace of the wreckage. We were in the vicinity of where our equipment was leading us. Now, this is where our story changes from one of exploration to desperation and danger. We get hit yet again with another wave of electromagnetic pulse, shutting down our entire system but yet again leaving only the very front lights of the ship. These were casting lights several hundred meters in front of us, but our internal lights began malfunctioning yet again. We're trying our best to keep our cool and not to panic. We were now slowly descending until we crashed onto the ocean floor. Unfortunately, we were only maybe 20 meters from the ocean floor, so landing didn't really do much damage, but now we're sitting ducks. In a brief moment, this massive wave smacks into our ship with so much force it hits us and causes us to topple several meters in the air broadside. We panic, on top of trying to regain ourselves. 
We felt helpless but to wait for the right moment. We had no propulsion capabilities, and our sonar equipment was down and going wacky. I remember thinking to myself, what made that giant wave down here? The movement in the water was so sudden, and my mind went to a place I did not even want to acknowledge. For a sudden force of that nature to happen would have to have been made by something of substantial size, meaning a large life form. I heard a sudden scream from my team. I turned and looked, and there fully illuminated by our spotlights was this. I, what I'm telling is like straight out of a scene from Godzilla or something. This massive eye staring back at us, and just then, it quickly moved upwards, and as our lights are shining on it, we can see it's attached to something colossal in size. But due to the size and force of this thing's sudden movement alone, we are hit with yet another wave, knocking us back even more, damaging our systems, sending us flying and toppling all over. Some of us fell unconscious for a time, but we tried everything we could to get the ship back going. Our internal ship's core was now failing after taking the damage from getting banged so badly. I tried my best to radio to the surface, but it was dead. Our sonar was still down, but our systems would intermittently flicker on and off for brief functionality. I know in that moment I needed to do all I could to get these systems back going. It's as if we had been getting hit with waves of electromagneticism, as if this life form we had encountered was like that of a colossal sized electric eel. In a way, the sonar was now back online, but it had been damaged. I can remember hearing a high pitched signal come from it before completely failed. I know this will be hard to believe, the sonar was now working, and the radio began working just briefly. I frantically radioed up to the surface, letting them know there was something down here, screaming at them, and we were aborting the mission. The sub was able to pull itself from the wedge of rocks it was up on, and we were beginning to successfully make our ascent back to the surface. That's when I got a reply from up top, and they told us, you are to continue on with your mission. The tone of their voice was commanding. I don't remember much after that, but I do remember failing to continue with the mission against my own will by forcing myself to stay awake from the lack of oxygen. Much of our internal systems were still glitching, and I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to make it to the surface without the systems failing and us sinking back down again. We reached the 4600 meter point, all before our internal systems began glitching out yet again. We pushed harder and harder to press onward when at about another 200 meters, our systems turned off, failing us yet again. Our impact on the ocean floor had now severely damaged our vessel. We were now free falling down to the very bottom of the floor, roughly a thousand meters below us. Slowly, this is when I realized we're gonna die. We were already limited oxygen, and we would not withstand very long. We're sinking quickly when we get hit with yet another wave of current from what I could only assume to be that large life form we had seen that shot out twirling down into the bottom of the ocean floor. This impact knocked all of us out. Oxygen was now depleting. We were going to die. I lost consciousness. I cannot tell you how much time had passed, but I awoke to our vessel slowly ascending in the water. We were being propelled up by a large sub-vessel that was taking us up to the surface. It turns out the ship above us had sent a vessel to come get us and was able to reach us just before we ended up dying due to oxygen deprivation. That's not to say we didn't endure long-lasting problems from having that much lack of oxygen. We were brought to the surface and treated for our injuries and, of course, reprimanded and questioned why our duties were not done why we failed to complete orders. I briefly informed them what had happened down there to all of us and the mission, but it was not worth our lives. We were also let go with strict word not to speak about anything we saw, the location of the vessels, the site, or any other sensitive information that they would deem. We were forced to sign documents and lots and lots of paperwork. I've been wanting to tell my story for years, and I think it's about time. I'm submitting this to an anonymous database, so whoever gets this can unveil it for the record. My age has changed, and important details about my life, like the years in service that I was in, have all been altered to further protect my identity. 
While the information in this story are real events, my background and other information are just placeholders. I hope whoever reads this understands. In the summer of 2020, specifically in early July, I found myself along Lake Erie, in Erie, Pennsylvania. It's fairly densely populated, and it's not rural. I briefly lived with a friend after my divorce in the Westminster neighborhood. There is a large park called Asbury Woods. Some of the trees are so old and tall that they can give you a different perspective on life if you let them. There are several paths you can follow. Although it can be crowded on some days, most of the time when I was there I was the only human. The place almost takes you back in time, if you can understand that. I've read about people seeing strange animals and flying objects who report feeling odd at the time of their sightings and experiences. Some call it the Oz effect because people suddenly feel like they aren't in Kansas anymore. Figuratively speaking, nothing like that happened to me, though I'm not saying I reacted calmly. My heart raced when I saw what I described as a dog man or dog headed man. I felt panic for some time. I put some distance between myself and the beast. However, it was comparable to what I might have felt if the same situation were reenacted. I'm here to tell you what I remember about that incident. However, I feel it's imperative to note that I have been trying for literally years to explain this sighting away. I am extremely unhappy to have been unable to disprove my own observation. I'd like to debunk it. So, I used to stroll through Asbury Woods a lot in those days, always alone because I was still emotionally recovering from my divorce. I walked on the same path I had taken three or four times before but something about this time was different. I could hear someone or something walking with me in the bushes. It was a sound I had not heard before. Then suddenly, out of the bushes appeared a man over seven feet tall. He turned and our eyes met. The strange glowing eyes stood out to me. The two glowing orbs were in the middle of a giant dog head staring back at me. Those menacing eyes were above two rows of giant yellowish fangs. They looked like they belonged in dinosaur skeleton mouth at the Natural History Museum. This was not a man. Within seconds the creature was on top of me and I was on my back looking up at the beast. It leaned down with its canine snout sniffing at me from head to foot. I tried not to move. I'd never been that scared before, as that thing only needed one bite to end my life. I braced myself for the most pain I'd ever felt when someone or something whistled at a barely noticeable volume. I might not have noticed it if the dog-headed beast had not straightened up the second the sound hit the air. Nothing seemed to matter to that dog man as much as that soft whistle we had both heard. It located the sound direction in a second or two and then I was abandoned as it burst off into the woods. That was the extent of my encounter. I have tried to tell friends and family about my horrifying account, but they refused to believe me. I contacted local animal control, as well as the Pennsylvania Game Commission. I never received a response to my inquiry. Right after I graduated from college in Colorado I was hired by the National Park Service. I soon relocated to eastern Tennessee and started working as a ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Since I was newly hired to the job I was assigned to patrolling and routine safety checks. This allowed me to roam around the huge and beautiful park. A few weeks into my employment I received a call reporting unknown animal tracks and activity all around their site. When I got there and saw what was there I thought one of the other rangers was screwing around with me. There were tracks but they were not recognizable. The tracks were human shaped but huge and with talons. I checked out the area and took a few photographs and then helped the family get to another campsite. I later turned over the photos to my supervisor expecting him to laugh and come clean on the joke. But instead he was upset, thinking I was playing a prank. I asked him to accompany me to the site. But by the time we could get out there, the rain had washed away the prints. A few weeks later I received another strange call. A campsite had been completely destroyed. The tents shredded and everything trashed. 
The campers weren't there at the time of the incident. There weren't any footprints observed, since it was in a dry area. But I found two tufts of brown hair and fur on the ground. On this occasion my supervisor saw the destruction for himself but recorded it as bear activity. The fur and hair didn't look anything like that of a bear. Two months later, in early September, I received a call about a lost pet. The young couple had been walking their dog, but it slipped off its collar and ran into the woods. They were very upset about the lost dog. Myself and five other rangers were told to search the woods and recover the dog. We started our search in three pairs. After we walked for hours, covering the area, we didn't see any sign of the dog. It was late in the day and we hadn't received any other calls. We agreed to stay out until dark before returning to the parking lot. As the sun set, we turned around and headed for the nearest trail. There was only another half hour of daylight remaining and we felt sorry about not finding the dog. But there was nothing else we could do. As we walked on the trail, heading back to the parking lot, we heard growling sounds. We had bear spray with us if we needed it. It was almost dusk and harder to see. We couldn't identify the source of the sounds. We continued walking hoping to leave the bear behind. One of the other rangers pointed out a tree that looked mauled. There were huge scratch marks and missing branches, like a black bear would do. I used my flashlight to look at the tree base. There were the same huge human-like footprints I had seen several months before. These prints were definitely not from a bear. I told the other rangers about the clawed footprints I had seen previously. The look on their faces was chilling and their apprehension was obvious. As we discussed the prints, we heard crashing and grunting sounds nearby. We kept moving, but faster. I twice saw a dark shape run past us to our right, but the trees made it impossible to see what it was in detail. The other rangers noticed it as well. It was very bulky and tall which concerned each of us. Then, without warning, the creature lunged out of the woods onto the trail about 50 feet in front of us. I could see a dog-like face in the twilight as it loudly growled. All six of us scattered into the surrounding woods. I tripped on a tree branch and hit my head on a nearby tree. I was dazed for a few minutes, but I kept my eyes open in the hope this creature would not attack me. Several minutes later, we called out to each other and eventually gathered back on the trail. The beast must have run off. We didn't hear any further growls or crash sounds. We quickly ran along the path and arrived at our trucks in the parking lot. We got in the trucks and drove back to the ranger station. The next day, each of us was told to write a written report about our search for the dog. I recorded exactly what we encountered and, as far as I know, the other rangers did as well. But our supervisor never mentioned the incident again. By the way, the lost dog was found unharmed two days later. It has been a long time since I had wanted to tell someone about what I saw, someone who would be willing to believe me and not judge me. It's been many years ago but I remember it as if it was yesterday. I was at work in Greensboro, North Carolina. Lunch time came and I left for my friend's house in Allen J, High Point. In any case, it was an early spring day about 12.15 PM. On a beautiful day. As I recall, it was 1992. As I turned down Nance Avenue on the way to my friend's house. Actually I was almost there. As I drove everything was fine. All of a sudden there was an 8 to 9 feet human-like being, maybe even taller, standing on the left side of my car on the side of the road. I couldn't believe my eyes. I slowed down to look up at it and it was very tall. The eyes were large and shaped like the normal cat's eyes we see for aliens. He was so black and dark. His cloak, as it appeared to me, came up and it seemed like he had on a toboggan type cap, but again it was so black that it melted in together with the cloak. It was skinny. And his eyes were shiny. Very thin and tall. No hands or feet were visible, he was just standing there staring straight at something. As I drove by, I kept looking in my mirror at what I was seeing. All of a sudden it turned and looked at me. 
Now the road I was on is hilly with up and down small hills. I was so fascinated by what I saw I wanted to come back. I never took my eyes off the humanoid as I could see just a little of him. As I turned around, I still had a visual of the humanoid. As I whipped my car around, maybe three to four seconds with my eyes not on the being, I realized he was past me. I was scared, but also fascinated. I think the only person who believed in me was my friend. I told her and took several shots of tequila at her house, which never fazed me. She said when I came flying through her door my face was very white and she knew something was wrong. I tried to calm down before returning to work. I have never seen another one, but I have seen mysterious things on the North Carolina coast where I go. Haven't seen a Bigfoot but I had two unbelievable experiences in 2017. The first experience happened at a campground. I was awakened around 4 am. By howling coyotes. About 3 seconds after the coyotes started howling, there was an erupting roar that sounded like it was coming from all sides and completely drowned out the coyotes. It was so loud and powerful that I could feel the vibrations coming up through the ground through my sleeping bag. Clearly nothing I've ever heard before. I've heard others describe hearing a roaring sound from these creatures coupled with the fact that I have studied this mystery for so long I knew right away that it had to be Bigfoot. This roar was so loud that the creature couldn't have been more than a hundred yards from me which is quite strange in itself because one side of the campground is a pretty busy road, but nonetheless the area in general of this campground is surrounded by forest. The second experience happened 30 days later. It was not far from where the first experience occurred. This time I stayed at a second campground that was much more secluded and deeper in the forest it was around 6 pm, and I and other campers were standing together talking about the hiking we had done earlier that day. Other people were out and about getting campfires started. Also there was a campground host who walked around introducing himself with a clipboard making sure people had paid and joined in the conversation. It was at this time that all of a sudden roughly 50 yard uphill on a ridge overlooking the campground a tree came crashing down. Moments after the tree hit the ground I and all the others standing around talking heard what can only be described as a loud guttural grunt. This is the kind of grunt you would hear from a silverback gorilla. All of us were startled, and asked each other what the heck fell that tree and made that deep guttural grunt sound. One of the other campers even mentioned it was probably Bigfoot. The other campers laughed but I didn't think it was too funny. This is because if one of those creatures was nearby, we might face a very dangerous situation. Thankfully nothing happened after that but here is where the story gets really weird. At the back of this campground is a dirt road. This road can be used for hiking or traveling during the hunting season. One of my favorite things to do when backpacking or camping is wake up early, get a fire started, and have a delicious hot cup of coffee. I got up that morning around 6 am, got my fire started and fresh coffee made. As I'm sipping coffee out of the dirt road at the back of the campground comes this white SUV completely blacked out. It has a huge sticker of a patty silhouette stuck to the back window. Me being the believer in the existence of these creatures, I have a few similar stickers on my back window so I took what I saw as a friendly visit from a fellow Bigfoot enthusiast. I casually walked up and said hello and saw if there was anything we could discuss regarding creature activity in the area. As I approached the SUV driver rolled his window down about halfway and I immediately noticed something odd. First there were two guys in the SUV and they were both dressed in full tact gear. They had two AR-15s on a gun rack at the back of the interior with both gentlemen wearing military style boots, pistols at the ankles, black beanies and sunglasses. I mean these guys were completely decked out like law enforcement officer would be, but there was no badge, just complete tack dress from head to toe. I then playfully asked are you guys looking for Bigfoot? The driver of the SUV then said to me why do you ask? I replied I see the Bigfoot sticker at the back of your vehicle, I have a couple of those on the back window of my car also. The reply I received is very strange, 
The driver just looked at me without saying anything and then the passenger guy in a very stuttering kind of manner said it's just a practical joke sticker from my girlfriend. After that response the driver then stepped on the gas and out of the campground they went. I just find it odd that there is a perfectly healthy tree being pushed over by a gorilla like grunt. Then these two tact or possible military guys show up the next morning out of nowhere driving a blacked out SUV with an oversized Sasquatch sticker on the back window. Very odd in my opinion. And that's it. Driving to Anchorage from Fairbanks is a long haul with huge stretches of wilderness and nothing in between. A few towns but the majority is mountains and plains. In a specific pass, me and my girlfriend at the time saw a floating upside down metallic V-shaped figure hovering in the sky. It would disappear, reappear, and show up in random spots. This is an area with no people, and no scientific equipment whatsoever. This thing was high enough to be a flying object but low enough to be seen by us. We stopped the car and stared as it as it zigzagged in height and distance from us for about 20 minutes and then it just faded away. It never returned and to this day we have no idea what the F it was. I have talked to people with similar reports in the same area. I was driving through the deserts of New Mexico alone at night. I'd been on the road for a while at this point. It was pitch black outside. There was, and I stress this, nothing around. I was probably 50 miles or so from the nearest town or rest stop in either direction. At the time I was listening to some tunes on Spotify that I had saved to my phone earlier as I knew my traveling would take me through dead zones in the Midwest. Suddenly, I hear static over the song. I check my connection to the headphone port on my phone and my radio. Seems fine. The static persists for a few seconds and then stops just as suddenly. Odd I think, but shrug it off, just some sort of electronic interference, even though I'm clearly using a hardwired audio input. It's at this point I realize that my song had stopped playing and it's now dead quiet in my car, aside from the hum of my CRV's little four-cylinder. Then out of the blue I hear whispering coming through my speakers. Multiple voices, think of the whispers in the show Lost. I can't make out what they're saying but I am petrified. Suddenly the whispering stops for a second and I hear a child laugh. More static on the radio, and what sounds like a man speaking slowly. Then, it was over, my tunes came back on. Every hair on my body was stood on end at this point, white knuckle grip on my wheel, and I added on about 30 miles per hour and noped the F out of whatever burial ground or dimensional rift I had just driven through. I don't believe in the supernatural at all, and it's likely that I was tired enough to have imagined the whole event, but that doesn't detract from the power the experience had over me in the moment. Far and away it was the creepiest thing I've ever experienced. About two years ago me and my friend were smoking in the forest at around 2 am. For some context this wasn't a US style camping trip in the deep woods. This forest is on the outskirts of London, Pole Hill if anyone's interested, and we used to hang out there in our little den and blaze. We knew the area very well and we obviously didn't have to worry about mountain lions or anything and we always felt reasonably safe. So we're sitting there toking away when all of a sudden we hear this noise coming from what sounded like about 5 to 10 meters away. It was loud and sounded like a really big gas valve being opened for a few seconds and then closed, with a kind of pop at the end. Or that noise a hot 8 balloon makes as it fills up. We were more confused and curious than scared as we knew there were no gas tanks or pipes or any hot air balloons anywhere near us but it was enough to make us both jump. It was especially strange because it was just not a mysterious or creepy location. Just a smallish wood mostly used by dog walkers. You'd go there for a walk as opposed to a hike. Anyway we decide to check about a bit in the direction it came from and when we couldn't find anything and we started joking about invisible aliens and I actually started to feel afraid. 
Then we saw about five people with lights coming across a small clearing towards us. Oddly, they weren't really walking together and were all separated by a couple of meters. And the torches they had were like 50 centimeter long strip lights. We didn't feel threatened, more like we just weren't supposed to be there so we left pretty hastily. We felt like they were looking for whatever made the sound. My friend likes to say an alien ship landed near us and we saw some government officials going to meet them. I would welcome a more rational explanation. My best is that there is indeed some sort of gas outlet totally hidden in the brambles near our den and the people were just British gas employees. Still seems strange though. I currently live near Portland, Oregon. I was recently talking to a neighbor about a strange encounter he had while working at Crater Lake National Park back in the late 1980s. The man was clearing brush and repairing a trail. One evening, soon after he clocked out, he realized he had forgotten his work bag, so he drove back to the work site. He began walking along the trail that led to where he had been working. It was then that he felt a presence like something was watching him. He says that at the time he had no idea what it was but knew it was definitely there. He continued walking and heard a strange singing sound coming from the forest. It was like a woman or a child was out there. He said it was haunting and strange. He said it seemed to be coming from the direction where he had been working which made him apprehensive about continuing. As a result, he became so concerned that he decided to retrieve the bag the next day. So he turned around and headed back to his truck. He began walking back but heard footsteps in the distance behind him. He turned around but saw no one, so he quickened his steps and continued walking. He then heard footsteps following him, and keeping pace with him. When he stopped, he said it wasn't long before he felt an overwhelming sense of danger. He began to run back to his truck. Just before he reached his truck he turned around and that's when he saw it. He observed two bluish colored eyes looking at him through the darkness. He said that there was evil in those eyes. As he watched, the rest of the creature gradually came to him. What he saw was humanoid in appearance and pale gray in color. He said it kept low. He was transfixed by the sight and paralyzed. It slowly crept towards him. Its head looked alien like in appearance. It then stopped and stared at him without blinking. Then it quickly turned and disappeared into the undergrowth. After standing there shocked and paralyzed for a minute or two he moved. He was intrigued by what he had witnessed. He then stepped forward to try to find this being and looked around for 30 minutes. He could not locate anything. There was no sign of it at all. He eventually gave up his search and walked back to his truck. He returned to where he first heard the singing sounds and now there were tracks that looked like dog tracks but were quite large. There were only four toes on each print rather than the five that you would expect from a normal dog. After looking at these tracks for a few minutes trying to figure out what made them he had this strange sensation. His mind went blank and he couldn't remember why he was there or what had happened. He then decided to leave the area and head home. The next day while at work his boss radioed him and asked if he had seen anything strange in that area. Another worker reported seeing something unusual. He said yes and described the humanoid creature with gray skin and evil eyes. His boss was dismissive and he attempted to explain it away. He and his boss went to the area to look for the tracks. Once they arrived at the area and after looking around for a few minutes he remembers that his mind went blank again. He blacked out again like before and when he looked up from the tracks his boss was missing. He then glanced at his watch. Over two hours had passed. It was now mid-afternoon and he couldn't remember the previous two hours. That terrified him. He walked back to the parking lot hoping to find his truck. It was still there. He got in and immediately returned to the main station where his boss was sitting in his office. He asked him what had happened but his boss just looked up as if nothing had occurred. His boss asked him casually how his day was progressing, as if nothing had transpired earlier. That was his last day working at Crater Lake. He realized he had encountered an otherworldly entity and wanted nothing to do with it. 
In the many years since that incident he has never experienced anything out of the ordinary. But he stays away from Crater Lake and never plans to return to the park. I live in Chicago, in East Garfield. In June 2017, I was at a local grocery store buying food. I walked to my car, loaded the two bags into my back seat, then got into the driver's seat. As I started the car, to my shock, a young pale-skinned woman with long dark hair was sitting on the passenger side. The first thing I noticed were her coal black eyes. She looked right into my eyes and said I need help. Please help me. She literally looked like the walking dead or zombie. I told her to get out, but she insisted that I take her to the hospital. I was scared. We weren't too far from the hospital, so I headed there. If she was crazy, I thought that I would placate her. We were about two blocks away and at a red light, when she suddenly jumped out of the car, took a few steps and vanished. No trace of her. She didn't appear like a ghost, but she was solid in form. It was as if she ran through an invisible doorway. The next day, I felt sick to my stomach and my eyes were sore and red. I believe it had something to do with this black-eyed woman. I didn't feel 100% until a week later and the terrible nightmares continued for months. This may not be related, but some of my family and friends had unexplained activity in their homes, including my brother. He lived a few blocks from me and swears there was a demon in his basement. He and his girlfriend would not venture down there and soon moved away. He had terrible dreams as well. I wish I knew what was going on. Some years back, I worked at a concrete plant myself, in an old quarry, which used to be part of a large estate, so the area was mostly mature woodland. This was December in Scotland, so it was getting dark by 3 pm, on a break I took my Jack Russell out for a wander and deep in the woods spied a tent. Since the dog is a cunt, she ran over to inspect and I had to follow, juniors refused to do f all they are told. Tent was old and the fly sheet was breaking up, I had to look inside but only cause there was no stench and the dog was there. Inside was a sleeping bag, steel mug and plate with cutlery and a football, all covered in moss. My shit scared mind came over all Blair witchy and I kinda ran to the nearest light patch out of the trees, only to find the edge of the quarry wall going 60 feet or so down to water. I often wonder if the kid did the same as me and found the quarry edge or just left his perfectly good stuff. This happened when I was around D16-17, 23 now, I spend a lot of my time out in the woods near my home, it's not exactly a secluded area, but I will never forget this strange ass occurrence. I live in a subdivision in Atlantic Canada mostly populated by your average families. I grew up with lots of kids my age living nearby and we would spend our time hanging out by the lakes or in the public parks. Unfortunately, drinking in those places would get the cops called on us, so we ventured into the forest to drink. Now this forest is really beautiful and incredibly ominous, it was an extension of the subdivision that was never developed, Almost like they went in and excavated narrow paths that would eventually become roads, but did nothing further. There are two old rusted cars that look like they are from the 1970s just chilling in there and many of the paths go nowhere, some of them go to completely different neighborhoods. This lil forest is used frequently by dog walkers, novice hikers and drunk teenagers. If you walk to the end of one of the many cul-de-sacs on the edge of the forest you will find a path that will eventually lead you to a wider main path. Or alternatively you can access the forest from the main road that is adjacent to the cul-de-sacs. Basically there is a bunch of ways in and out of the forest minus the river to the north. About 20 minutes along this main path there is a steep hill you hike down and you end up in the pit. It's a perfect location to be loud and rowdy and not get the cops called, but close enough that you can find your way out fairly easy in the dark. Now that I've set the stage, I'll get on to the creepy part. One evening I was with a large group, 30 or so, 
of rowdy teenagers making our way to the pit when we came across a circle of tall white candles all in a circle, maybe about 10 meters away to the left in a clearing. They were unused and we all frequented this forest enough to know they were placed there recently. We thought it was a bit creepy but we assumed it was just a Halloween prank since it was October and we continued on to the pit which was about 5 minutes away and down the steep hill. Being quite the drinker I don't remember the walk back clearly, but everyone made it home safe. The following day my friend and I trekked back into the woods to retrieve her jacket and a full quart of rum. On the way back we spotted the candles only to notice that the candles were all burned down. Keep in mind they were those tall white candles seen in religious ceremonies so it took some time to burn them all the way down, and six bunches of black fabric that wasn't there the night before. I'm going to assume robes ah, my friend and I noped the f out of there as fast as we could. Once we were at her house we figured out how late we were out the night before, 3 to 4 am? And that our group could have possibly walked by those robe wearing candle burning weirdos, not noticing because alcohol. For the next couple months my friend and I would go and check on the candles and robes, not ever going off the path to check it out because paranoia, until one day the robes vanished, but the candles were moved. Right to the edge of the path. Though not exactly thrilling, it's something that still creeps me out to this day and I would say it's damn mysterious. Since then, construction on the area has significantly widened the path and completely excavated the clearing where the candles once were. I still go hiking down there all the time but the place has lost its ominous feeling. When I was 15 my friends took me to this place in my hometown. It was about a 30 to 40 minute hike on a very poorly marked path through the woods and you could come out at the top of this giant hill overlooking a few towns. It was a pretty cool spot and after going two times with my friends, both times at night, I felt like I can totally navigate this the next weekend I brought my girlfriend just me and her. I got us up on the rock and we hung out for a while and decided to go back down and call my family for a ride, I'm 15 still. So we start walking down through the woods and we get lost. Really lost. I had never really paid attention to going down as much as I had going up. So we're pretty much wandering through the woods at this point with a cell phone flashlight and aiming in a general direction. Then out of nowhere about 100 yards away from us a flashlight just turns on. We both froze. It didn't move. I knew that there was a guy employed by the county who lived and worked in those woods. I had met him a handful of times and he was a nice guy. I assumed it was him and he could direct us so I called out hey. Loud. No movement on the flashlight. I called out louder hey flashlight turn on us. Then it turned off. Then we heard a rustling like leaves heading in our direction. My girlfriend whispered run in my ear and we both booked it as fast as we could. After maybe 10 minutes or so I recognized the beginning of the paths and got us back to the road where we called my parents and got home. It was a very weird experience and I still get a bit freaked out in the woods if I can't see like a road or house or anything. This happened to my grandfather years ago. I guess he was out hunting and walking around in some woods maybe 5 miles from a main road near where my family settled north of Pittsburgh. He said that he started seeing these burnt out candles and started picking them up for some reason. He followed them for like a 100 yards and at the very end there was a circle of black candles with a hole in the ground that looked to be a grave. He brought all the candles home and my grandma yelled at him and made him throw them away. I used to often spend my summers bouldering with my friends by a relatively large forest that was about an hour and a half away from where I used to live. We used to spend some of the nights camping out there just to save some travel costs and time. Anyway. I think this was roughly like the third or fourth time we were out there camping, my friend had left all her climbing gear and her rucksack just outside her tent or we definitely think she did anyway. The next morning we found her boots, a few clothes and all her chalk powder had disappeared. 
We figured that it could have been completely feasible that she misplaced it, although we were quite sure that they were next to her tent we didn't really want to believe that they were stolen. Anyway, we didn't read too much into this and just stupidly said to ourselves that perhaps she had left it by the boulders and some animal took an interest to it. I know it sounds stupid but it was very reasonable to us at the time anyway fast forward a year, we're at the same spot as usual, sitting by the tents and chilling after having some food. Mind you it's pitch black out, and only the camp area is lit by the fire. I go somewhere a bit out of sight for a slash and what do I see? A dude in a full-on ghillie suit laying on his stomach looking right towards our campsite. I kinda stood there frozen as this dude clocks that I've seen him and he just bolts it out of there. I don't know whether the event to the year prior was related to the Gilly guy but this definitely has stuck to all of us. We haven't been back there since which is a damn shame. We were way the f out there in the middle of nowhere on BLM land in Colorado. We drove for an hour and a half down a forest service road and didn't see another soul. You could see headlights and hear cars from miles away from our campsite, it's not like somebody could have snuck up unnoticed. We had three cars with us and eight people. Just got done eating dinner, cleaned up, it was getting dark so we went back to the cars real quick before hitting our tents for the night. Somebody had slashed the front right tire on each of the three cars with what appeared to be a box cutter. Everyone thought it was a prank but it become very apparent, very quickly that it wasn't. All of us were beyond spooked, like panicking, scary to watch spooked. We all had spares, and one dude had a gun, so we threw on our donuts while that guy literally guarded us and got the hell out of there. I still have nightmares about it sometimes. Just knowing there was some person, probably watching us, maybe wanting to harm us, makes me feel physically ill to this day. Edit, well this blew up. To answer some questions, this was south of gypsum. And it was 100% not private land, this was a marked forest service road in an area with dispersed camping I had visited several times before. There were three guys and five girls, the guys were all together cooking the whole time leading up to us discovering the tires being slashed. These people are my best friends and this would be wildly uncharacteristic of any of them. For those wondering how we didn't hear it, our cars were parked 30 yards away from our fire or tents. And a car coming down a road is easy to pick out from the sounds of nature. A gentle hissing gets lost in the wind. We heard it as soon as we started walking up. The tires were slashed on the exact same spot on the sidewall. It would be almost impossible for something on the road to puncture the tires like that. Also, there was no cell service. We called the cops and ranger as soon as we got back to the highway, told them exactly what FS road we were on and gave them coordinates, but there isn't a lot for them to do. Cop told us it was good we were packing and to be careful out there. A tangential experience your story reminded me of from when I was younger. My buddies told me about an abandoned mansion in the area and my curiosity got the best of me to go check it out. According to what they said, the neighbors were fond of calling the police whenever they saw someone unfamiliar checking the place out, so me, being the, not, genius I was, decided to go the back way through the woods, cause the house was relatively close to a trail. I pulled the address of the allegedly abandoned mansion up on my phone and punched it into my GPS, then went off into the woods, checking and basically stumbling off the trail to move myself closer to the mapped address. For the curious, this wasn't a serious trail where this could put one in danger, Meadowdale Beach Trail for the curious. Some might know the house I'm talking about, if they're from my area, but hey. Anyway. Partway through I found my way to a strange, paved back road in the middle of the woods. Never figured out what it was, didn't follow it. I'd come from one side, from off the trail, and on the other side was a steep hill. I thought I heard a car, I didn't, panicked, and climbed up the hill to hide. At the top, I spotted a group of about a dozen tents. This was about 1 to 2 p.m. in the afternoon, but a solid 30 plus minutes from the trail, with only what appeared to be a private road. 
I promptly crapped myself and slipped away before seeing anyone or waiting for them to see me, but did end up finding the mansion after all this, albeit on a different trip into the area. It was the night before Christmas Eve in 2000 or 2001. My dad and I were driving about 10 miles to a grocery store. I can't remember why we went to one that far away from home, as there were closer stores, but for some reason, we were on the other side of town at this grocery store. We needed to buy some supplies for the next day, as we were hosting Christmas Eve for our large extended family. When we were done, we loaded up the car and moved a little quicker than normal because it was starting to snow. At that time, we had a cheap car that was not ideal for snow travel, so we wanted to get home as quick and safely as possible. I checked the time and noted that it was just before 8 p.m. I remember that, because I really wanted to get home, help my mom make cheesecakes. My dad thought he would be able to shave some time off the commute back home if he cut through the residential area behind the grocery store. So, that is what we did. We began to navigate through the neighborhood. My dad had taken this way before, so he knew where he was going. We came to our turn and made a right onto a street and we were looking at Christmas lights and commenting on the really well done decorations and the not so well done decorations. Dad made a left at the next street and we saw the same decorations on the same houses. Dad even said out loud, didn't we already see that house? I agreed and even pointed out an ugly house that I remembered. It was really memorable. I can still remember it actually. When we came to the end of that street, my dad knew he needed to make a left, but last time, when we made a left, we didn't end up where we wanted to be. So, he made a right. Again, it was the same street. When we were sitting at the stop sign, looking ahead onto the street where we were going to go, it didn't look like the same street. But when we drove onto it, it changed. Just like before, we recognized the houses and dad stopped the car. He looked at me and I looked at him. Somehow, we were stuck on a loop. The snow was starting to accumulate, and dad didn't want to put the car in reverse, for fear that we'd slide or something. So, we kept pushing forward. I have to mention, that as we are making numerous passes on the same street, a straight street by the way, it wasn't a curved road. There are no tire tracks in the thin layer of new snow. If we were traveling the same road a minute ago, our tracks should have been there. Moving on, we passed all the same houses again and came to the same stop sign again. This time, dad made a left like he had the first time. This time, the street changed and it was the street he wanted to be on. But, we noticed that in the last few minutes, the snow had gotten really deep. Probably two or three inches in a matter of, what we thought was ten minutes. I glanced at the time and noted that it was 9.14. I said, Dad, it's after 9. He hit the brakes and looked at the clock. My dad was a Vietnam vet. He wasn't afraid of anything and I never really saw him display anything other than calm stoicism. Except that night. That night, I saw actual confusion and fear pass over his face. He stomped it down pretty quickly, but for a moment, I saw it. He was freaked. We finally made it to all the familiar routes to get home. When we pulled into the driveway, we both just sat there for a minute. Then, Dad said that was weird. We got out and brought our groceries in the house. For being in the trunk for over an hour, the frozen items were still frozen. When we walked in, my mom and brother both said, almost in unison, where have you been? We didn't know. I am emailing you to tell you about something that happened to my granddad. This is a story he told me around Christmas time last year that happened to him, and I was spooked out. I have known my granddad all my life and trust him more than most. He would never glamour up a story to make it sound better or anything like that. When he told me this I believed it all happened how he said it did. I never took him as a man with strong beliefs about anything paranormal and he was not religious like my gran his wife. When he told me this, I noticed he was so normal and quiet. 
It happened in the late 60s. He moved down to Manchester from Glasgow where he met my gran and got a job as a bus driver. One night he worked a late shift into the early morning hours, operating a double-decker bus. There was just him driving, and another man conducting he worked with. It was the early hours of the morning and the bus route he was taking was from Manchester City Centre straight to Rochdale Town Centre, around 8 or 9 miles. As he drove this route he stopped at a bus stop, just outside Manchester Centre, and picked up two young boys, around 10. He also said it was strange because they shouldn't be out at this time. He described them as odd, but anyway he let them on and they paid and climbed upstairs to the top deck. These two kids were the only two he picked up on the route from Manchester to Rochdale. My granddad arrived at the last stop in Rochdale and waited for these kids to get off. He waited, and nothing. So the conductor walked upstairs to get them. They were departed, there was nobody up there they checked everywhere, under the seats. And there was no way they could have left. They would have had to walk past my granddad to exit the bus door. There were no broken windows, and you couldn't open them enough to jump out. They open maybe around 5 cm at the top to allow air in, but that's it. My granddad was freaked out, but the conductor was totally freaked out. He refused to stay on the bus and finished the route back to Manchester bus station with my granddad. But, the weird thing was, when they counted the money from the bus that day, the money that these two kids paid with wasn't there. It didn't add up, as if it was never there. I was with my parents on vacation at Russian River in California. We had rented a cabin that was probably 10 miles out of a small town. The cabin had a dry river bed behind it, and one day I decided to go exploring. I was walking along the riverbed for maybe 15 to 20 minutes when I came across a large and abandoned camp site that was in a clearing. There were five or so old tents, with clothes and stuff scattered about. Everything was really dirty and tattered looking so it has been there a while. I was standing there staring at it wanting to move closer, but knowing I shouldn't. As I was taking the scene and I heard a stick snap in the hill up to my right. I whirled around looking in the direction scanning the tree line but didn't see anything. Seeing as there could be at least five people hiding, judging by the tents, I decided to turn around. I was walking as quickly as I could along the rocky river bed without tripping, all while occasionally hearing a twig snap or the crunch of leaves once every few minutes over to my left. I kept looking behind me and up at the trees to see if I could see anything but didn't. I finally made it to another clearing where the tree line was further back and whoever or whatever was following me would have been forced to step into the open or move way further away to stay concealed. I took the chance to run the remaining distance as fast as I safely could back to the cabin. Could this be a Bigfoot? Once I went biking and camping in the Missourian Lakes District in Poland. Except a few ports full of tourists it's quite a remote place and you can ride for lots of miles through forests without meeting anyone. So me and my ex-boyfriend had a map of campsites in the area and moved from one to another. Usually those were typical campings, with staff electricity etc. But sometimes we slept in abandoned sites which was pretty creepy. Anyway, one day we decide to go to this campsite by the lake my boyfriend visited when he was a kid. We even found online that it was still open and hoped it'll be fine. Previously boyfriend told me of an old Prussian cemetery in the forest nearby and that some of the graves were open so you can see human bones, I was scared as hell but thought it'll be okay if there are people around. So we go there but it turns out there's no road to this place and we have to cross some fields on the way there, leaving nearest buildings more than 4 miles behind. Meanwhile. There's a storm coming from the opposite side of the lake. When we get there, everything's in complete ruin. There was some food left as if someone didn't care about finishing it. The buildings of the campsite were deliberately destroyed. Even the pier was taken out of the water, remnants of the campsite just floating around. I was really scared and wanted to get back but my boyfriend walked around and said it'll be fine. 
So with all the destruction around there was a portable toilet just standing there like no one cared to take it away. It was closed, I approached it and heard wailing from inside. It was very loud and sounded like a human crying, but without any words. I ran to my boyfriend and said I'm really scared. He told me it was just the wind but after approaching the toilet he admitted it did sound like a human. We tried knocking and asking if everything was okay but all we heard were those crying noises. We even tried to open the thing but it was like someone was holding it from the inside and crying louder and sadder. There was also an empty beer bottle in front of the toilet, like someone entered it and someone else put a bottle by the door. As you can expect, we got more scared every minute, with the storm and the forest and the graveyard and this wailing so we just ran away from there. My dad once told me how he and a couple of buddies were hunting in the deep New Zealand bush and suddenly stumbled into a small area where the bush or shrub had been all squashed down. It quickly got really weird as they noticed that something really large had moved from there. Like just thrashing or forcefully crashing its way through the bush. It got shit freaky as they also noticed that there was massive amounts of fresh, i.e., wet, blood accompanying the trail of broken bush. Apparently we're talking about heaps of blood, like Jesus Christ, surely whatever made this is bleeding out and lying dead just around the corner. They kept tracking this thing for 10 to 15 minutes expecting to find? The largest bush mammal we have here is deer and there are no large predators here. So they keep tracking and suddenly the blood or crash trail abruptly stops. All signs of bush crashing and heavy bleeding come to a sudden and unexplained end. This was deep in uninhabited bush and still to this day there is no logical answer. For so much recent blood loss and no explanation for it, needless to say they were all really creeped out. I work on the search and rescue team, and I have a very interesting case to share with you. I know I'm not allowed to normally discuss this stuff, but I believe that this missing case might be the work of an alien abduction. It all began when I received a frantic call from a mother about her missing daughter. They were camping just outside of Bend, Oregon. I rushed to meet them at their campsite. The family had been staying there for a few days, and on that particular morning, the mother and father went down to the river while their daughter climbed into one of the riverside trees to get a better view of the scenery. That was the last anyone saw of her. She disappeared without a trace. The mother frantically searched for her, but there was no sign that she had fallen or ever come down from where she was. The family became grief-stricken and panicked, finally calling us for help. We searched all around the area for any clues but couldn't find anything. The whole day passed, and as evening approached, we expanded our search party, but still, there was no trace of her. Even the dogs couldn't pick up on her scent. Eventually, the helicopter located her about 12 miles north of the location where she had gone missing. Miraculously, she was completely fine, unharmed, and unscathed. The dogs helped lead us to her, but when we found her, she was in a state of complete and utter terror. She was rocking back and forth, murmuring strange things. We asked if she was okay, but she didn't reply. She was taken back to her family, but her expression remained unchanged. She never gave us any concrete answers about what had happened to her, just murmuring about being taken and not being allowed to leave. It was puzzling how she had traveled such a distance in such a short amount of time. The terrain between her and where she was found was rough and challenging, yet she was unscathed in her outfit and flip-flops. It simply didn't make any sense. I can't help but think that something extraordinary happened to her, and part of me wants to believe it was aliens. It's the only thing that seems to explain everything. But, of course, I could be wrong. We may never know the truth behind what happened that day, but the poor girl was clearly frightened by something or someone that took her and transported her over a vast distance in the blink of an eye. I remember this being back in 2012. I was on patrol along the Mississippi River just outside of St. Louis. 
The area I was patrolling is considered one of the most haunted areas in all the United States. We get a lot of reports from people who see things like ghosts and whatnot. So at about 4 a.m., dispatch received a call from a frantic lady who was talking about seeing a man with glowing red eyes and huge fangs coming out of the woods towards her house. Now, this woman specifically was known to be on medications that cause paranoia and schizophrenia, so we initially thought it might have been some kind of hallucination brought on by her medication. But she sounded panicked, telling us there might actually be something going on, and so we had to check it out. We arrived at the area she called from, a lone gravel road leading to an old farmhouse. As we got closer, I began getting this odd feeling like something bad was about to happen. When we got up to the house, you could see something or somebody appearing to be huddled behind an old tree stump near some bushes, but since it was dark, you couldn't make out who or what it was until we got close. As we got close enough, I could finally see who, or rather what, it was. At first, all I saw were two green eyes staring back at me with an expression that seemed like terror. I couldn't exactly tell what it was, other than it wasn't human but looked like some sort of ape or monkey. That's when it stood up, and it was easily nine feet tall, looking like this thing could have attacked somebody and destroyed us. Its long brown hair kind of flung off its body, and it had pointed ears on top of its head. But what really caught me off guard? initially hiding behind the stump, was its long snout and large fangs. I thought this might have been some sort of rabid bay or something, but I have never been filled with so much terror before in my life. This thing jumps up in the tree instantly and then leaps back toward us in a pouncing motion, swiping one of its claws. A second one of these creatures steps out of the woods right by where the first one attacked and begins to run towards us. My partner and I fire a couple of shots as these things give chase, and we quickly dart back to our vehicle. They all dart off back into the swamps. We had to go get back up, and we realized that this situation wasn't safe. This was not the last time that we encountered what we like to call the wolves of the Everglades. In fact, there's a much longer version, which I'll probably share with you in a separate email. But for now, I don't think these creatures are innocent. I believe that this woman was not just on her medication, these things were truly trying to break into her house, and who knows what they would have done to her. How they got in remains a mystery. I found myself panting heavily as I leaned against a tree trunk, my heart pounding in my chest. The events of the night had left me shaken to the core my mind struggling to comprehend the horrors we had just witnessed. It all began when our group of amateur hikers, led by our fearless adventurer Norris, stumbled upon an abandoned ranger station deep within Yellowstone National Park. The ranger station stood before us, weathered and worn by the passage of time. Its windows were shattered, and the door hung loosely on its hinges. Intrigued by the mysterious history that clung to the structure, we made the impulsive decision to spend the night, oblivious to the station's haunting past. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an eerie glow over the surrounding forest, darkness fell upon us like a suffocating blanket. We gathered inside, our flashlights cutting through the thick veil of shadows that consumed the station. Unease settled upon our group, and an unspoken tension hung in the air. It began subtly, with faint whispers carried on the wind, disembodied voices that seemed to echo from the walls themselves. Goosebumps prickled along my arms as the ethereal sounds intensified, words I couldn't quite make out, but which carried an undeniable sense of anguish. Suddenly, ghostly apparitions flickered into existence before our startled eyes. Figures, translucent and hazy, materialized and disappeared in an instant. We caught glimpses of tormented souls, forever trapped in the realm between life and death, their sorrow etched into their spectral faces. A shudder ran down my spine as my gaze shifted toward the open doorway. Emerging from the darkness was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It crouched, its long, emaciated arms hanging down against its sides, the skin stretched tight over the prominent ribs of its bony chest. 
What I had initially mistaken for white fur was, in fact, its sickly pale, death-like skin with eerie gray undertones. The creature's head was that of a human, but one ravaged by malnutrition and decay. Its hollow eyes were disproportionately large, reflecting the faint glimmers of sunlight, and they seemed to pierce through my very soul. With a guttural growl, it lunged toward us, teeth bared in a sinister snarl. Pure terror surged through our veins, overpowering our sense of curiosity. We turned and fled, racing into the night, driven solely by an instinct to survive. As we burst through the tree line into a small clearing, our heaving breaths were momentarily stilled by the sight of a park ranger jeep parked nearby. Relief flooded over us, and we quickly huddled together, sharing our terrifying encounter with the park ranger. But our hopes of finding solace and reassurance were shattered as he dismissed our story with a scoff. His eyes bore an expression of skepticism, and he chalked it up to hallucinations induced by drug use. We pleaded with him, our voices trembling with desperation, assuring him that we were clear-headed and what we had experienced was all too real. But the ranger remained unmoved, dismissing us as mere fools who had wandered into the realm of hallucinatory nightmares. Defeated and dejected, we trudged away from the ranger station, our minds forever scarred by the horrors we had faced. I was going through the hiking trails with my dog, behind my town's local high school, fairly late one night. I had gone there plenty of times before since I was young, so I wasn't frightened. While I was walking my dog, he kept trying to stop and was whimpering, which was strange, because he is normally a very brave dog. After walking for about 10 minutes longer, I heard huge branches crashing and breaking. That's when I started to become frightened and decided to turn back. While walking back, I could tell that something was following me. I was terrified. Suddenly, after a minute of calmness, this creature leapt in front of me, across the trail. The creature had long, dark fur and was enormous. It wasn't a bear. It was like a very muscular, huge wolf. After seeing this, I picked up my dog and sprinted off the trail, without seeing it again. That was easily one of the most terrifying nights of my life. This afternoon about 5 p.m. I had went to pick up my daughter from work. She works in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, right near the high school. I parked in the lot which is backed up to a little wooded-like area and was reading Facebook on my phone while I waited. I had this feeling of being watched come over me. I started looking around and turned in my seat to look into the trees to see if I saw anything and I saw this big dark figure standing there watching me. I turned back around in my seat hoping it didn't realize I seen it and lifted my phone up just enough to film it in my rear view mirror. You can see it moving around. It even stands up taller for a bit before ducking back down. I needed to see if I could get a better look cause I was starting to second guess myself and what I was seeing. As I opened my car door and stepped out I moved to the back of my car. And looked and I heard what sounded similar to a deep growl and it bolted into the trees. It was so fast I didn't get a good look at it. I cannot say 100% that what I'm looking at is a dog man but it's something let me know what you think. Since it was summer break for my school, I was lazily lounging at home watching TV. I got bored, so I went outside to see if I could do anything with my chickens, like feed them worms and snails. Before I go into more detail, I should explain the area I live in. My home is on the outskirts of the city I live in. I had about five or seven chickens at the time, and we hadn't expanded the coop, so it was a small pen connecting to two sides of the chicken coop, which is wooden and sturdy, the only ways to get into the coop is either through the trap door attached to the big door and the three windows, one window is on one side of the door and the second window on the other side. The third window is a large window. Keep in mind that they all have traps connected to them so they can be closed. We have seven acres of woodland that we call the back pasture, 
and if you've ever been back there you could see that it's a popular habitat for the local deer. There was also a wild boar that was roaming around at the time, and I don't know how it got there. We had been having trouble with poachers for a while, considering the population of deer in the woods. One poacher had set up a trail cam, one that was motion activated. There was an old rusty deer stand that had been put on a tree a long time ago, and the tree had begun to grow around it. Beyond our acres of woods, there's a large cornfield owned by our neighbors, and beyond that is a forest. I don't know what the forest is like beyond the field since we've never been there. I went outside to do something with my chickens, and I had brought along a bucket of corn for feeding the deer after. When I walked out of my home, I saw a doe was sitting in the tall grass, I thought it was sleeping since it had its head down and wasn't moving. I, being the curious little nut I was, decided that I would sneak up on the deer and get a picture of it to show to my mother when she got home from work. I crept as silently as I could across the yard that separated me from the deer. I should also mention that we have a clearing with a burn pit in it that was filled with cedar branches. I was creeping across my yard towards the deer, and when I had cleared the burn pit and was about 10 yards from it I realized that the deer wasn't asleep, but it was dead. It was the most disgusting sight I had ever seen. Its intestines were completely gone, the flesh on the body of the doe shredded to pieces and blood absolutely everywhere. It looked as if it had been sitting there for a while and it smelled like it, too. Most of the blood was dried and the air reeked with the stench of rotting flesh, urine, and what seemed like a hint of wet dog. Something that creeped me out about the scene was although it was a rotting carcass, there were no insects at all around it, it was as if the usual lively forest was deader than the deer. Not even the neighbor's cattle made a sound. It looked as if the poor deer had simply been left after being brutally attacked and half-eaten which it most likely was. I left the bucket at the beginning of the trail, thinking that I would come out later with my mother and grain the deer when she got home. Then, I started to walk back to my house. I had barely taken a few steps when I heard a low, snarling growl that sounded like a wolf. Although it seemed distorted as if it were being played on an old radio. Sorry, that's the only way I think of describing it. Against my better judgment, I turned my head around, and I saw what looked like the biggest freaking wolf I'd ever seen. It was on all fours, its fur was black and matted in places, its face was what you'd expect a wolf to look like, although it was broad and the muzzle seemed a little short. Although the way it was curling its lips made it look as if its snout was plenty long, and its eyes were yellow. Not a bright yellow like the yellow of a flower or the sun, but a dim, amber, red-yellow, if that makes sense. Its ears looked like that of a Doberman pincer, with the cropped effect. Its front legs were long, and it looked as if it were a bodybuilder. Its paws, if you can even call them paws, looked like huge hands with long claws at the end of them. It stood up, and I heard the most sickening popping sound you could ever imagine. It sounded like the sound of popping joints, but it seemed amplified as if it were being played through a microphone and the sound was coming out of loudspeakers. Its body looked like a bodybuilder's pumped up on steroids, it was so big. It had no tail, that I could tell, and it seemed to tower over me. Although I was a good 10 meters from it. I was about 5 foot 4 inches at the time, and I came nowhere close to its height. It was so tall that the tip of its ears could almost touch the top of a young cedar. It let out a loud howl, which sounded more like a roar and it charged at me. Doing the only thing I knew to do while hyped up on fear and adrenaline, I began to run away from it. I remember clearing my yard in what seemed like hours but was most likely only a few seconds, and running inside. Slamming and locking all of the doors and windows. As I calmed down a small bit, I had realized that if it had really wanted to kill me that it would have. That what I had experienced was not an attack charge, but a bluff. I was lucky to get away with my life. Although this happened almost two years ago, it still terrifies me to think about it. The deer was gone the next day, and ever since that evening I have been weary around the woods, only going in them in broad daylight, only when I absolutely had to, and never without a weapon. Sadly, 
I cannot say that I am one of those people that have stopped experiencing things after the encounter, although I only had nightmares for a month after that day in June. Nothing really started to happen again until about two months ago when I was staying up at night playing on the laptop. I had started to hear things moving around on the porch and turned on the light to see the shape of something huge disappearing behind the corner of my house. There was also one of the rare times I went into the woods after the first encounter when I was helping my mother clear brush from the hunting clearing. I was going to get the mower, and was walking the trail to do so when I heard bipedal footsteps following me off to my side. They stopped whenever I stopped, and I eventually ran out of the woods and I haven't been back since. I asked my late great-grandmother about the creature I had seen in the woods, and she informed me that there was something called the wolf head man that stalked the Kansa tribe, preying on small children that strayed too far from their teepees. Later, I was informed by my history teacher that my house had actually been built on a tribal burial ground, and I have since been wondering if that had something to do with it. I hadn't heard about the wolf head man before she had told me about it. When I saw that there were several eyewitness reports that were proved to be truthful, it made me feel a lot better about coming out with this information. I had attempted to tell people previous to this submission, but everyone either said I was stupid, crazy, or just a plain liar. One thing's for certain, I am not stupid, I am not crazy, and I am most definitely not a liar. I know what I saw, and what I saw was a dog man. I think I had an encounter with Windigo. My friends and I recently went to Sierra National Forest for a camping trip. About two hours deep for dispersed camping. The day was wonderful, I personally ended up falling asleep fairly early, 10 am. When I woke up, half my group was in shambles from an unsettling story. Our campsite was all close together, however one of the individuals slept in a hammock about 50 feet from everyone else's tent. When we woke up, he had us if anyone else heard me scream his name. The strange thing here is I've referred to him by a personal nickname rather than his name for years. He had expressed to us that he heard the yell of his name, in my voice, around 3 am. And it sounded far away, however nobody else heard it. Just thought that was very strange. This happened about two weeks ago and we're still chatting about it as a collective. Four years ago, an unforgettable hunting trip took place, etched in my memory like a vivid painting. I was accompanied by my trusted companions, Uncle Jack, my brother Larry, and Frankie of Warm Springs, may he rest in peace. The season was perfect for elk hunting, with October to November casting a beautiful blend of colors over the landscape. Our destination was the wilderness near Mount Hood, a realm of nature's untamed majesty. We ventured off the beaten path, leaving the main road behind at the Bear Springs Ranger Station, and journeyed across the rugged ridges toward the McQuinn Strip, an addition of the Warm Springs Reservation. As we trekked through the dense forests and embraced the solitude of the wild, little did we know that an awe-inspiring and terrifying encounter awaited us. In the distance, around 800 yards away, we spotted an astonishing sight, two big feet in a meadow. Our hearts pounded with both amazement and trepidation. The massive creatures had apparently taken down an elk and were feasting on its flesh, tearing off chunks with ease. It was a sight that defied belief, mythical beings, as real as the wilderness surrounding us. As we watched through our rifle scopes, captivated by the scene unfolding before our eyes, another Bigfoot emerged from the brush to join the group. Moments later, a fourth one appeared, smaller in stature, but still an impressive five feet in height. The big feet ranged from seven feet tall to the smaller one at five feet, their presence alone enough to send shivers down our spines. While we were in awe of these magnificent creatures, our primal instincts kicked in, and we felt a growing concern for our own safety. If these majestic beings could so effortlessly take down an elk, could we be their next target? The idea of being on their menu for dessert was enough to send a chill down our spines, and with that realization, we chose to retreat. As we made our way back, 
Uncle Jack shared a story that added to the sense of awe and fear surrounding these mysterious beings. He recounted how a friend had witnessed big feet herding deer for the kill, illustrating their intelligence and cunning in securing a high-protein diet that sustained their impressive size, strength, agility, and speed. Our minds were swirling with questions and emotions as we hiked out of the wilderness. The encounter had left us both amazed and terrified, forever altering our perception of the untamed world around us. We had been privileged to glimpse these elusive giants of the forest, and yet, the lingering fear of what they were capable of haunted our thoughts. Since that fateful day, we continued our hunting trips, but the memory of the big feet remained etched in our minds, a constant reminder that the wild had secrets beyond our understanding. It was a chilly afternoon in the heart of the forest, and I was hiking along a scenic trail, enjoying the solitude and the beauty of nature. The rustling leaves under my boots and the distant chirping of birds created a peaceful ambience around me. Little did I know that this tranquil hike would lead me to an inexplicable encounter that would forever remain etched in my memory. As I trekked deeper into the wilderness, I noticed a tree line not far from the trail. My curiosity sparked, and I decided to venture closer to take a peek at the dense vegetation beyond. My heart skipped a beat when, from the corner of my eye, I saw a large figure moving amidst the trees. At first, I thought it was a bear, and my heart raced with a mix of excitement and fear. But as I focused on the creature, my astonishment grew. This was no ordinary bear, it was running on its hind legs. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I must be seeing things, but there it was, unmistakable. This creature was sprinting, its arms raised above its head like a human running in a race. My mind was a whirlwind of emotions and confusion. My instincts told me to retreat, but my curiosity held me in place, trying to comprehend the bizarre sight before me. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing, it defied everything I knew about bears. They don't run on their hind legs, do they? The creature continued its unusual dash along the tree line for what felt like an eternity but was probably only a few seconds. Then, as abruptly as it appeared, it vanished into the thick foliage. My heart pounded in my chest, and my mind raced with questions. What had I just witnessed? Was it a bear imitating human-like movements, or was it something entirely different? I cautiously made my way back to the main trail my thoughts consumed by the enigmatic encounter. As I returned to civilization, I couldn't shake off the image of that strange creature. Later that day, I decided to share my story with a few fellow hikers and locals. To my surprise, I was met with skepticism and disbelief. People often mistake things in the woods, they said, bears don't run on their hind legs. I nodded, trying to accept their rational explanation, but deep down, I knew what I saw was real. The memory of that bear-like creature, running on its hind legs with its arms raised above its head, remained vivid in my mind. During the summer of 1987, I was hiking with eight other teens and three adult instructors in the Three Sisters Wilderness in Oregon. We were heading up a low ridge around dusk, over to the left and towards the base there was a small pond and as we reached the top there was a small lake to the right down the other side of the ridge. The instructors set up camp further up the ridge about 50 yards from us. We were setting up our tarps and collecting water for the night, making dinner act. The sun was down but it was still light enough to see clearly for maybe 30 more minutes. Alex went to relieve himself, and we could still see the instructors up the hill from us when all of a sudden a rock about the size of a bowling ball came flying into our camp. We were shocked, then started yelling at Alex. Knock it off, et cetera. Then another one came and another. The rocks were not too close to us but close enough to be somewhat of a danger. Then Alex came back, we all got in his face and were really upset, then another rock came down. We all ran up to where the instructors were at, and told them what happened. They of course thought we were full of it, when from out of nowhere again came Anther Rock not so close but again close enough. 
It is getting quite dark now and all sat back to back in a circle, with our ice axes in our hands. I think we stayed up all night, but the next day we all just left and never spoke about it again. About 10 years ago I was living with my aunt, and I basically had the basement family room to myself. The house setup was odd because the basement had its own entrance, which was really ground level, and the rest of the house was built into or onto a hill. In order to walk in the formal front door you would have to go up a flight of stairs, but right off the driveway was the basement door. The house is old, and the lock on the basement door is tricky, and there have been many nights when I just went to sleep and forgot to, or didn't lock the door right, it had to be slammed shut, etc. One night I awake from sleep in a distressed panic, as if I was having a nightmare, but I didn't, to the best of my knowledge, have a nightmare. Basically it felt like something bad was transpiring. As I lay in bed I could hear someone tinkering with the basement lock and door. I listened to verify, and then it becomes painfully aware that someone is outside, trying to get in. I walk over to the door slowly, and look out the peephole but I can't see anything because it is way too dark outside. There is a switch to turn on the floodlight about 4 feet from the door so I switch it on and quickly get to the peephole to see who is out there. When I look through the peephole I see a middle-aged, bald, somewhat husky white male but I can't see his face because he is looking back at where the light is, I guess he was checking to see who put a light on him, or what was going on, I run upstairs, wake up my family, grab a golf club and call the police. They take 30 minutes to get there, shine a spotlight around the yard and leave. I didn't get any sleep that night. I spent a lot of time hunting by myself in the American Southwest, mainly Arizona. I am always armed and this story will explain why. I was three days into a week-long predator hunt. I mainly hunt coyote but also buy a mountain lion permit as they frequent the area and often respond to my predator calls. I awoke one night in my camp to voices around the perimeter of my camp. They were all in Spanish and in a hushed tone but in the desert, noise travels very far. I was sleeping in my pickup truck camper but had the windows open for ventilation. I awoke to the voices and quietly readied my sidearm in case they were smugglers or someone looking to rob me. I waited for what felt like hours in the darkness but really was maybe 20 minutes. After a time I decided to investigate instead of fall back asleep. As quietly as I could I put on my boots and grabbed my rifle and peered around me. The moon was half full and the sky clear so I could see a great distance around me. I saw four figures huddled around the remains of my campfire using it to heat some sort of pot or can as food or water. I waited inside my truck trying not to move as I didn't know their intentions. After about a half hour they quietly moved on in the northern direction but I never fell back asleep. I waited until dawn before going back to sleep and reported them to the border patrol agent on my way out of the range. I never saw any footprints or signs that they were even there the next morning, only a small depression in my fire where their pot or can had sat. Other than that they were gone without a trace. I assumed they were just people crossing the border illegally to find work or trafficking drugs but I never knew for certain. I shudder to think what would have happened if I had confronted them as I don't know if they were armed or not. I don't go hunting alone anymore. Eight years ago, I found myself in Bend, Oregon, a place that seemed to harbor whispers of the unknown. As I explored the charming town, I stumbled upon an intriguing tale that would ignite my curiosity and lead me on an adventure I could never have imagined. I had the chance to strike up a conversation with a lady who had camped near Paulina Peak, a majestic peak that stood tall at 7,897 feet. The thought of camping amidst such breathtaking scenery excited me, but it was her story that truly captured my attention. She recounted a night, eight years prior, when her peaceful camping trip took an unexpected turn. In the early morning hours, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the wilderness. 
The sound was like nothing she had ever heard before, and it sent shivers down her spine. Frightened and perplexed, she decided to share her experience with the local forest service rangers from the Deschutes National Forest. The rangers were attentive as she described the terrifying scream she had heard. They revealed to her a plaster cast of a Bigfoot track, left by a creature that had been spotted crossing a road by two of the rangers themselves. With conviction, they assured her that the scream she heard was probably from the very creature that left that intriguing track. Intrigued and captivated, I was eager to learn more about this mysterious encounter. I sought to track down the retired ranger who had witnessed the Bigfoot track, hoping to hear more about this enigmatic creature roaming the woods of Oregon. However, my efforts to follow this lead were met with obstacles. The Forest Service personnel seemed tight-lipped, unwilling to share any further information. So basically I was with a group of friends walking from one condominium to another, there was a forest between these condominiums, with a fence dividing it from the sidewalk. I was behind the group with one of my friends, we were walking through a slightly dark part of the street and suddenly both of us saw some some white thing in one of the trees, it looked like a slime and it was moving in a really weird way, had no legs, no face, and it was a really powerful white, like there's no chance it was a light or something else, I called for the other guys and as I shouted it started climbing really fast in a really bizarre way as if I scared it, I turned on the lights from the phone to see if I could find it but honestly I was scared too and my heart started beating fast, so I just started running away with my friend. It was so good to have him there, cause we talked later and both of us saw the same thing and even complimented each other as we talked, so I was sure I was not hallucinating. Of course none of our friends who were in front of us believed in what we said, some of them got intrigued but I wouldn't blame them for not believing it, as I wouldn't blame you, it was really strange, it was like that venom slime but white, it's my only encounter with something that I just can't explain what it was, it really looked like it was not from earth. Edit, just thought as the post got some attention I figured I should give an update. First off wanted to thank everyone that participated, I didn't know this subreddit, Never participated that much on Reddit but I've read some interesting posts here and I'll probably stay around, I don't think I'll ever post any other story here again, at least hope so. Wanted to thank in special the two guys who shared their stories seeing this white thing, have talked to other people about this, but people either don't take it seriously or just have no idea of what it is when I describe. I went back to place today around 2 pm to see if there's anything there but unfortunately just found nothing, I still have no idea what it was and I may never know, all I can do now is wait if more people from these condominiums will notice it. Cause I swear on everything, that thing is not an animal, that is just beyond science. My husband bought me a voodoo doll a couple birthdays ago in New Orleans. It was a vampire to keep you safe at night. I thought it was cute, but I did not put too much stock in it being real. Anyway, fast forward to a couple weeks ago. For some backstory, my husband was a boy scout. He has no fear of the wilderness and is strictly a don't worry until you have to person. We had been camping for several days at this point so I was not spooked either. It was a very normal, happy night. When we arrived at this campsite, I got the idea to grab our vampire. We normally keep him hanging in our car. He would not budge. I'm talking my husband and I both tried to get this clip to open for a good 10 minutes, and it just wouldn't. We thought maybe it had melted together in the heat, joke that he needs to stay in the car for some reason we are unaware of, and we went about our day. Fast forward several hours, we are in our tent at Sipsy Wilderness with our kids just hanging out after they went to sleep. With no prompt, no scary rustling in the bushes, no bad feeling, nothing, I get the urge to ask my husband if he's scared. I suddenly feel my hair standing up. He says yes. Without even talking to each other about what we should do, we both instantly grabbed the kids and ran for what felt like our lives to the car. Toss the still sleeping kids in the back seat, my husband buckling them in the car as I'm driving away. 
I'm big on car seat safety, but I didn't even wait. I just had a feeling we had seconds to get out of there. We didn't even get a chance to discuss what was going on when a random car passes us leaving the empty campsite. This is 2 a.m. in the freaking remote wilderness in nowhere Alabama. The entire campsite was empty that whole day. I just drive faster at this point leaving all our belongings behind. We arrive at the closest Walmart, maybe a 30 minutes drive, and the employees are outside. Walmart is closed. Seriously there are about 10 employees outside just staring blankly at our car. If anyone has an explanation for this please let me know. It was eerie, but this may not be anything. I guess there might be overnight stocking where 10 employees are taking a smoke break or something at the same time, but it just seemed off. We parked in the lot away from the employees as not to spook them, but they just kept staring. They didn't speak to each other or move. I decided to keep driving. I felt like I was in the twilight zone. I had no idea what to do at this point. So we just kept driving around and napped in the car with keys and ignition ready to book it if we needed to until the sun came up. We returned to the campsite, packed our stuff as fast as we could, and we never went back. We have since spent all our camping time at Chiha with no instances like this one. The weirdest part? That next morning, my husband tested our voodoo doll clip, and he came right off the car immediately. It's almost like he refused to leave our car that night to keep us safe. This probably doesn't explain everything the way it actually happened to us, but in summary, we got a really weird urge to run, saw some weird stuff, and now I'm afraid to go back to Sipsy. What do y'all think? So I was hunting with my dad up in the mountains a few years back and we had called it a night and returned to camp. After more than a few beers and some whiskey we went to bed. Now we weren't sleeping in tents or anything, just some ancient army cots under the stars. After dosing off I hear our old ice chest open and then thud shut, and that old ice chest had a very loud and squeaky hinges so it was very noticeable. I assumed it was my dad getting a water bottle. A few seconds later it happens again and repeats a few more times. So I turn over to ask my dad how is he so drunk that he can't operate an ice chest to find he's still asleep and snoring next to me. I reach for my mag light and shine it on the ice chest to find a black bear rummaging through it, he takes one look at me and runs off with something while I yell at him. Later the next day we find the bottle of Crown Royal a few feet away from camp unopened. We always share a laugh about that alcoholic bear. Hi, everyone. I don't normally make posts like this but this is a very strange occurrence that I just had the urge to share. I do consider myself spiritual, but I am in no way religious or actively practicing anything. Yesterday, I was in my bedroom with my younger sister and I was braiding her hair. It was taking a long time and I really had to use the bathroom, so I told her to give me a minute and I walked out. It's important to keep in mind I didn't tell her where I was going, what I was doing, or how long I would be gone. I just got up and went straight to the bathroom. I was in there for about 10 minutes because I had gotten into an argument with my friend over text, which is important to note because it doesn't normally take me long to use the bathroom. After I'm finished, I walk out of the bathroom to wash my hands, our sink is on the outside. When I walked out, I was in direct view of my sister because the sink is across from my bedroom door. As I was washing my hands, I noticed she was staring at me with a perplexed look on her face so I asked her what was wrong. She calmly asks me how I could have walked out the bathroom. This was a very oddly worded question so I asked her what she meant. She asked me, weren't you just in the living room? And I told her no, I've been in the bathroom the whole time. My sister began to look very sick as she told me I just talked to you in the living room, when did you walk in the bathroom? In a very concerned tone, I insisted to her that I did not enter the living room, and since I had gotten up and walked out of my bedroom, there was no point in which I had entered the living room. I asked her what I had said to her when she saw me in the living room. She tells me that she saw me sitting on the couch with my hands neatly folded, 
and I was staring off into space. She then told me that I had a very disturbed and concerned look on my face, which prompted her to ask me what was wrong, to which she claims I responded nothing in an eerie tone. My sister claims that she the me she had seen looked just like me. My hair was in a loose bun, I was wearing my same grey shirt and old red pajama pants, my face was the same, everything was the same. But it wasn't me. I know it wasn't me because I have no recollection of that happening. I was in the bathroom the entire time distracted by my heated discussion. I have no idea how this happened, but my sister told me after our exchange she felt nauseous, like something was off. I'm not sure what to make of this. I am a pretty rational person and have heard stories like this before. I want to look into possible carbon monoxide poisoning because it has been known to cause hallucinations, however, only my sister has experienced this. Neither me nor my roommate have seen anything out of the ordinary. We've been theorizing about parallel universes, possession, demons, curses. But we really don't know what's going on and are just looking for some answers. On my first and only backcountry hike, me and two much more experienced friends set up camp at 9,000 feet in the southern Sierra Nevada. The first day we saw a black bear cub wandering around the other side of a small lake, which was a little tense, but we didn't see any other bears the rest of the hike. That night, we all ate and then crashed early, but I'm a light sleeper and the altitude was messing with me. As I'm trying to read with my headlamp, I start to hear some low moaning sounds. It sounded like the groaning movie sound effects when a huge storm is brewing close to a ship as the winds whipped up. After a few minutes, I called out from my tent to my two friends, what the F is that? Not completely sure it wasn't a bear. They both immediately acknowledge they are alarmed as well. We all open our tent flaps and just watch as the winds get stronger and stronger. The trees at our altitude were sparse but there were a few huge ones circling our sight. The ground we were on was mostly settled granite slag and boulders, and we were 1000 feet from the top of a very long and very narrow canyon, probably a half mile wide, there's probably a better geographic term for it. There were five of these canyons all descending from a 10,000 foot peak. This sound increased until the wind picked up enough to tell us it was a huge storm of some kind. No clouds, no rain, just torrential winds. The wind at our ground level was not extreme, but the sound of what was going on above us was insane. Every now and then a blast of wind would shudder through our campsite, but the tops of the trees above us were swaying so severely that the trunks were moaning as loud as a car going by. Debris was falling all around us, big enough to render us all silent, even though we could hear each other, because there was nothing we could do. I will never forget that sound. It almost sounded like a huge steel tanker crashing against rocks, with a low growl and a high-pitched squeal. With every growl came a huge gust of wind that plunged down the rocky slope in a vortex that passed maybe a hundred feet over our heads. I'll never forget watching those tree tops bend to a frightening angle and then the residual blast of air that hit a few seconds later. This is a story from my mother and younger sister, who I will refer to as S in this post. It happened in Brooklyn, New York in the late 90s. I was in the second or third grade, S was around four years old. We had a back porch, overlooking a small fenced yard and lawn. We'd get the occasional regular-sized praying mantis. According to S, one day she was playing in the yard, while my mom was hanging laundry up on the back porch. Apparently, this thing just suddenly materialized right there in the middle of the yard. Because S says she turned around and there it was. She just stared at it for a few moments, not sure if it was a toy or what. She said it looked like a two and a half to three foot long, praying mantis with big red eyes and tiny black pin pricks for pupils. When the fear finally hit her, S ran up the stairs shouting for mom. All she could express at the time was that it was a big bug. My mom barely reacted OFC because kids get scared by normal bugs all the time. Well, the damn thing followed S up the stairs. 
For so long I've imagined what that must have looked like. S convinced my mom to go inside with her. That's when mom finally saw it. While she and S were watching it from inside through the mesh door, the praying mantis perched itself in one of the chairs on the porch. Not like on the top of the back cushion or on the arm rest or something, just in the chair proper. When my mom went looking for a camera, all at once it just disappeared. I asked if it flew away but neither of them have an answer. It was gone as instantly as it showed up. When my dad brought me home from school around a half hour later they were still hiding behind the mesh door looking terrified. I never got this full version of the story till S was older. For years she would become hysterical if she ever saw a praying mantis or even the image of one. I wonder about what this thing could have been or why it only showed itself to mom and S. I do know, however, that as I got older I found that my mother was a very abusive woman and S, I believe, suffered the most because of it. Makes me wonder if one of the people I've told this story to is right about it being a demon. Or at least a bad omen. About seven years ago, camping with my future wife by a small lake a few lakes over into Crown Land. Government owned, but not park land in Canada, near my family cottage. We'd cleared a bit of brush right on the shore of the lake for our tent, set up camp, ate, hung our food, and went into the tent to sleep. Middle of the night I wake up to the sound of something huge moving through the bush nearby. It got closer and closer, and sped up a bit, crashed through some brush probably no more than four to five feet from the tent and kept going. Eventually close to daybreak we did get back to sleep, and in the morning we found a trail of trampled bush and unknown scat not far from where we were sleeping. This happened to me and my then roommate a few years ago. We were just chilling on the couch and listening to the rain outside when at one point we started talking about how the rain sounded like the sea, and how we pictured a lighthouse on a windy shore. I know this sounds crazy and maybe like we were on drugs, but we were not, we were completely sober. Slowly but surely the conversation between my friend and I started to shift to a visualization, or perhaps a hypnosis? It's unclear to me how this normal conversation about a lighthouse turned into the shared vision or dream it did, but at one point we were both there, in the lighthouse. We both saw a man there, dressed in a yellow raincoat. He had a weathered face and a grey beard, but most remarkably in the place where his eyes were supposed to be there were two black holes, as if they had been gauged out and only some rotting black skin remained. We both felt this intense urge to get out. So we ran away from the lighthouse to the woods as he followed us. I'm not sure about how we woke up from this hypnosis, dream, vision or whatever it was but I remember realizing this was bad and we needed to. Wake up. So I urged my roommate to do so. After I returned to my body I gently woke them up and we discussed what happened. When we had entered this state it was around 12 midnight. But when we woke up it was about 3 am yet it felt like we had only been doing this for 15 minutes. The next day we both secretly drew the man we saw, we were both illustration students, without having discussed what he looked like. We drew the exact same man and had given him the exact same name, the Wehrman. My question is, what was this? A state of hypnosis we entered through the rain? Fully adieu? Or something supernatural? If so, does anyone recognize a figure of a lighthouse keeper in a yellow raincoat with no eyes? I worked at a state park and would regularly go days without seeing another person when my boss went away. So my boss was away one week and left his dog with me, and I was wasting time around my lunch break throwing tennis balls for him. I threw one really far away into the woods to give myself some time to eat my sandwich, and a maybe 10 minutes later he comes bounding out of the woods and drops this. Jaw right at my feet. I didn't touch it, but it was this grayish mass of skin and bone with bits of torn pink flesh underneath. Then it had about 7 or 8 of these long, thin, and very sharp teeth sticking out of its strange angles along the jawbone. 
It wasn't bloody, so it wasn't something the dog had killed, and it stank so it was probably old. I left it on the concrete where the dog had dropped it, took him with me and spent a little bit of time searching around in the woods in the direction he had come back, which was unnerving, but I didn't find anything. Then when I went back to where I had left it, it was just gone, and suddenly the dog started growling at the woods and his hackles went up. Right then I got in my truck, dog jumped in back, and I went home for the day. When my uncle was in his teens and early twenties he used to go on a yearly backpacking trip in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest near Mount Baker National Forest with a group of friends. They, there were five of them, knew each other from high school and over the years as they went their separate ways in life, college, etc. The trip became a way for them to reconnect with one another. Anyway, the first time they made this backpacking trip they were cresting a peak and came across a wide valley view. They were off trail and making pace cross country, but could navigate well enough given geography, my uncle in particular is a pretty experienced outdoorsman, and was even back then. To their surprise, especially given that there weren't any trails nearby for at least a couple miles, the group saw a large house on the side of a small lake. There was a small water plane parked on a dock adjacent the house, but other than this everything was entirely wild, no trails, no campsites, nothing. The group was shocked, but didn't think much of it the first time. It seemed to be a pretty rad house, so they assumed it belonged to some rich somebody and that it was just a private retreat. It was still pretty cool though, so they decided to return to that mountain crest every time they went on this trip to look at the house. Well, three or four years later when they came across the house there was no plane on the dock. They figured this meant that nobody was home. This time, they decided, they were going to check out the house. So they made their way down, which took a while through the thick, trailless forest. What they came to was a remarkably fancy modern style cabin home. Three floors, huge windows, a massive deck with a state-of-the-art barbecue. Everything one would want in a sick-ass hidden mountain retreat. Cool. While they were poking around, a plane landed. Instead of running and hiding, the group decided to explain the situation. So they did when they met a nice gentleman who had flown in. He was very kind and courteous and pleased to show them his vacation house. From then on each time they went on the trip they would stop there for a night if the plane was present. Only one year my uncle became curious. What's the deal with this place? So at night, while they were sleeping in the house, he crept around and investigated a few of the many rooms it had. In the basement he found what explains everything. Massive piles of weed and brick form stacked row upon row next to stacks of cash. Instead of freaking out, he went back to sleep, and didn't tell his friends until they had left the next day. Not exactly spooky but I feel like it fits in with the vibe of this threat. A few years back my fiancé and I went up to stay at her parents' property in Northern California for a weekend to camp, hike, do some astrophotography and generally just enjoy nature. This place is a good 20 minutes from any real town, and far enough from any big city that you can faintly see the glow of the Milky Way at night. The property is pretty huge and has a cabin, but we both prefer sleeping out under the stars so we set an air mattress in the bed of my truck and pulled it up next to the pond. We got there a little after 3 in the afternoon and after getting everything set up, we decided to go for a walk. This being just a quick walk, I left my phone, wallet, keys, etc. in my backpack to avoid any distractions, even for just a little bit. When we got back about a half hour later, I noticed that my backpack was zipped open and laying on its side. I was sure that I left it zipped up and standing up. I was concerned and brought it up to my fiancé, but she convinced me that I probably just remembered wrong, as I sometimes do. The night goes on and some clouds roll in, ruining our chance to stargaze, so we decided to get to bed a little sooner than normal to get an earlier start the next morning. After some wilderness sexy times we hit the hay. 
Sometimes I have trouble sleeping at night, so while she sleeps I'm often left laying there for an hour or so until I'm actually out. It's never bothered me too much, but this night in particular I remember wishing I could have just fallen asleep. A little while after we both went to bed, I heard something splashing in the pond next to us. I didn't think much of it, probably just a small animal, maybe a deer. Worst case scenario, maybe it was a mountain lion, but I've heard they don't bother campers all that often anyways, so I wasn't worried. It wasn't until I heard the word hey from somewhere across the pond that I was legitimately freaked out. My heart was beating out of my chest. I turned my head to see that my fiancé was still fast asleep, which was good, because I don't even want to imagine how she would have reacted. I laid in silence for what felt like hours, but probably just about 5 seconds later I heard the word hey again. This time it was a little closer than before, and I knew it wasn't just the wind or my ears playing tricks on me. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.